Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the regular meeting of council to order. Our clerk will be Ms. Sheila Gurry. Ms. Gurry, um, I understand we have some late items to introduce. Yes, thank you, Worship. For late items, we are adding agenda item 2A, add community charter sections 90, subsection 1, subsection E, and K. And that's thank it, Your Worship. Very good, thank you. I'd ask for a procedural motion to proceed in camera. Move Councillor Thorpe, seconded Councillor Prino. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Thank you very much.
Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the November 21st regular meeting of council. I'd like to first recognize that we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Sinemic First Nation. Our clerk tonight will be Ms. Sheila Gurry. Tonight's regular meeting of council will be held in accordance with the Community Charter and Council Procedure Bylaw 2018 number 7272. The question period sign-up sheet is on the table by the double doors to my left for agenda items only. If during the meeting any member of the gallery has a question regarding an agenda item, please write down your name and the agenda item on the sheet. Uh, members have been granted the authority to join meetings electronically uh, tonight. Councillor Brown, I know, is going to be joining us shortly. He had to dash home. Uh, and the first item on the agenda is the introduction of late items. Ms. Gurry, please. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. So the first item for late items is moving agenda item 8A, snow and ice preparedness, to agenda item 12A and reorder the remaining agenda items accordingly. For agenda item 10, consent items, add the finance and audit committee recommendations from November 16th, 2022. We're removing ag agenda item 11A, solutions to major issues in Nanaimo. This was a delegation unrelated to agenda items and we just found out late this afternoon that they won't be joining us this evening. And reorder agenda item 11C, Voice of the People, to follow agenda item 11D, Nanaimo Area Network of Drug Users. And that's it, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Motion for adoption of the agenda is amended. Moved Councillor Thorpe, seconded Councillor Prino. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Motion for adoption of minutes is circulated. Moved Councillor Hemmons, seconded Councillor Armstrong. All those in favor, any opposed, none, motion carries. Mayor's report, I have a few public service announcements, I'll call them tonight. Uh, for those of you who have seen it happen, we're in the annual fall catch basin cleaning program, which uh, began on November the 7th and will continue to December the 5th. Uh, for four weeks, uh, beginning on November the 7th, City of Nanaimo Public Works staff and contractors will be out cleaning the city's stormwater catch basins. Given the late fall this year and the number of leaves, it's going to be a more challenging prospect than usual. I see Mr. Sims, our General Manager of Public Works, nodding sagely and sadly. Uh, during the program, storm sewer grates are pulled off and the catch basin is then cleaned out using a vacuum truck. The material is then separated from any water, dried and taken to a regeneration facility. Uh, so please, drivers, cyclists, pedestrians, you're asked to watch for crews and traffic control personnel on the roads and be aware of missing grates near the work zone. And in case anyone hadn't noticed, uh, winter is upon us. Um, so we're reminding everyone to prepare for the upcoming storm season. Uh, around the home, uh, you're asked to clear leaves and debris from catch basins yourself uh, if they're not cleaned up. Uh, in the event of snow, property owners or occupants are required to remove snow and ice from sidewalks in front of their properties within 24 hours so the pedestrians can have a safe place to walk. If you're using our parks during the time, would you please exercise extreme caution? Trails, boardwalks, bridges, stairs, and playground equipment can become slippery and hazardous uh, when there is rain, ice, or snow. On the roads, a little reminder, and we will get a report again later tonight, but a reminder, as this seems to cause an annual level of frustration with people, the city's priority, and always has been, and I suspect always will be, to plow and maintain priority one routes, which are emergency routes and all major roads. Residential areas are typically plowed and maintained within 96 hours unless snow and icy conditions return. Uh, snow, crow, snow plow crews back to priority one routes. Roads can become narrower as plows uh, clear snow to the sides. To help, residents can park in their driveways, please, or on even sides of the road on odd, on even numbered days and odd sides on the odd numbered days. It's hard to plow a street when both sides of the road are filled with vehicles. Uh, drivers are reminded to ensure that vehicles are winter ready for driving in snow and ice conditions. Please slow down and leave extra clearance for snow plows. Uh, if you have a concern or a suggestion regarding snow and ice control, you can contact the City of Nanaimo Public Works Department at 758-5222 or uh, by email publicworks.worksinfo at nanaimo.ca. We are also asking for nominations for the 2023 Culture Awards. The deadline for nominations is Friday, December the 2nd uh, at 4 p.m. Uh, we're seeking public nominations from the community for these awards. They recognize outstanding organizations, groups, and individuals in the arts and culture fields. 
This is the community's opportunity to recognize people and groups they believe have made a significant contribution to making Nanaimo a culturally vibrant city. There are three categories for nominations. Recipients will be recognized at a special celebration at the Port Theatre in April of next year. Uh, firstly, excellence in culture. Secondly, honor in culture. And third, emerging cultural leader uh, designated for people under 30 years of age. And the, your new council is engaged in uh, orientation, but also a great deal of work around the budget for 2023 and the city's 2023-2027 draft financial plan. And residents will have an, a number of opportunities to review, ask questions, and provide input leading up to a budget-focused e-town hall on Monday, December the 5th. That has been the practice in this city since, I believe, Ms. Gurry, 2013. Uh, Council will begin reviewing draft budgets and project plans over the course of four special finance and audit committee meetings on November 23rd, 24th, 30th, and December 1st. All of those meetings are, of course, open to the public and will be held in the Vancouver Island Conference Center's Shaw Auditorium, which were, you were physically gathered tonight as is Council. Uh, the E-Town Hall will start at 7 p.m. during the Council meeting and will run for an hour. Uh, and if necessary, an additional 30 minutes will be allocated and residents can participate in the E-Town Hall in a number of ways, including on the city website, on Twitter, on the E-Town Hall event found in the city's Facebook page by calling in uh, Monday to Friday, 755-4521 or in person during the meeting. So you're all invited to have your say around the expenditure of the city's funds. Uh, we are a large operation, $3 billion in assets under management, 900 plus employees, and a budget of over 200 million a year, including capital. So it behooves you to pay attention. And I say that particularly given, and I'm gonna be a little bit critical here, um, because we had a very low voter turnout, uh, lower than even normal. Uh, and I just think it's really important that citizens recognize they have an opportunity to participate and to comment and to attend council meetings and influence public policy. So I encourage all of you to take part. We have nothing to rise and report, Ms. Gurry, uh, from the in-camera meeting. We have no presentations, no committee minutes. Uh, there are a number of consent items, a motion for adoption. Moved Councillor Perino, seconded Councillor Thorpe. Uh, all those in favor? Carried, thank you very much. And we have a number of delegations tonight. Now, I'm looking at the audience, and I want to remind everybody, although there is always a temptation to show approval or disapproval. Um, the meeting of the council is a place where democracy can freely take place. It's, it's spo supposed to be in a respectful and safe manner. The council chambers is a workplace and there are considerations uh, for council and staff to make sure that a safe work environment exists in accordance with WorkSafe BC regulations. In support of this, I ask quite simply there's no cheering, jeering, or other outbursts from the gallery at any time. No clapping, no approval, no disapproval. That will ensure that when anyone is speaking, whether they be a member of council or a delegation or staff, it is not interrupted and they can make their point freely without distraction or fear of ridicule. Uh, in instances where a speaker has exceeded the time limit, um, I can, in theory, cut off their microphone, uh, but I will not do so, uh, obviously without fair warning. Uh, and if necessary, council may call a recess in order to reset the environment uh, if things uh, become somewhat difficult. I expect and trust tonight that won't be necessary. There have only been a couple of occasions in the previous term of council uh, where that was necessary, and I trust it won't apply tonight. Having said that, the delegations unrelated to agenda items uh, We'll start off with uh, A, which is solutions to major issues in Nanaimo, and Dr. Don Johnson, Van Crowley University, will speak on that. Pardon me, sorry, mine's not up to date, yes. Sorry, Your Worship, um, there should have been an up-to-date one put on there, my apologies. So they dropped out late this afternoon, so you'll be starting with um, Nanaimo Area the Drug Network of Drug Users. And that's Ann Livingston. And Ms. Livingston, good evening. And you'll have five minutes. Thank you. Um, okay. So then Nanaimo, can we go to the next slide, please? Do I have control of that, this thing? 
And which one do I press? This one? So I didn't get into a lot of history because five minutes isn't very long, but we were previously located at 42 Nickel. And it is my understanding that the landlord was um, threatened with a number of fines, including a nuisance property fine. The, we were inspected a number of times. So the purpose of a drug user group is to do advocacy, education, and support. After we weren't there for six months, we met at Tim Hortons, and uh, there was a rally held at Sheila Malcolm, since I'm showing you this um, poster that was put up. The um, overdose drug toxicity deaths are a very serious problem in Nanaimo. I assume you, know, you guys know. I just wanted to show this slide because it makes it clear that in 2007 to 2012, there were less than 10 deaths a year, and um, this year is set to exceed 60 deaths, which is going to be higher than 2017. There were 51 deaths last year, and there have been 51 deaths up to October 1st. So this is a bit disturbing, this um, odd blacking out of people. These are people who've consented. It's Shane Steinhauer. He's doing another project called um, Night Keepers with Heather, who's also blanked out here. I just wanted people to see that the Nanaimo Area Network of Drug Users was given a grant of $80,000 to last for a whole year. That's the salary of one bylaw officer, just so you get a perspective. So um, anyway, we got a number of other grants, but we're all volunteer driven. And I put this picture in so people could see the charming lot at 264 Nickel before we moved in. Um, the Provincial Peer Network is funded by Sheila Malcolmson's office through the Overdose Emergency Response Center. And um, we, we once we set up, uh, this was the cheapest property in Nanaimo to lease. It was the people who leased to us. We looked for six months. And I mean, I've seen a lot of properties, just saying. And um, we applied for a city permit and were promptly turned down um, or told that we were needed to meet many, many requirements. I think what's being misunderstood is this is a self-help project. It's similar to a fellowship. It's similar to any club. Uh, we do not serve the public. If people come on our lot, they're members of our organization. and. Um, so we were open from 10 to 6. We extended the hours to 10 to 10. Over 200 people a day come. And it well may, may well be one of the busiest overdose prevention sites in the world. That's how crazy this town and how much is needed and how attractive the place is for people to come. Um, this was a picture of Heather McDonald, um, who is, you know, puts her name on all of the um, papers anyway. It's Ms. Livingstone? Strange. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. We're just having problems with the people online being able to see the slides. So we're just going to stop the share and reshare so that um, Councillor Brown, who's attending electronically, so he's able to see your slides. And our apologies for the redactions too, just while we're at it. Um, unless we have the permission ourselves, we can't show those information. So my apologies for that. And this is from Dr. Sandra Allison's um, report. Um, we're on track to exceed the number of deaths, as I previously pointed out. Nanaimo has got a fatality rate 30% higher when compared to other Vancouver Highland Health Authority communities, and deaths are trending upward. This map um, is courtesy of the Nanaimo Area Public Safety Association. I could never find it. Um, and it just shows you the darker the spots, the higher the rates of death. And this is a little square set out which has Nanaimo, which shows that it's downtown and south end that have the highest number of overdose deaths. And um, this is a breakdown of the overdose deaths. 45-year-old um, is the average age. I just want to point out the average age of COVID death was 82, just so we're very clear. We um, anyway, left. sorry? A minute left, please. Pardon me? A minute left, please. Okay. So what we're doing is peer support, and the value of peer support, I suppose, is not fully understood. This is the number of, of volunteers that we engage with, which is one of the reasons Vandu's 
I mean, Nandu is very popular. That's the tents we have. There's some more redacted. That's the media we've received. And um, this is a ticket that was sent to the owner of the land for setting off fireworks. Um, or, or this one is, sorry. And um, I think that's an unusual thing, but um, you guys are free to explain to me why that is normal. And um, this was a wound. This was a gaping hole in a human, and there's hundreds of these throughout Nanaimo. So the citizens of Nanaimo need to understand that when they go to Emerge and they can't get in because it's plugged up, it's plugged up with people that are using Emerge as their only health care, and they're transported by ambulance at least $1,000 every um, day in a hospital or even the emergency room visit is racking up to a 1,500 or 2,000, which of course up, please, is a case you. for um, homeless um, building homes is way, 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 way cheaper. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm sure council has some questions for you. Councillor Manley. Well, thank you for your presentation. Can you tell me um, how the site is managed? Because we have such um, a dearth of um, funding, um, rather than opening a site where drug users would come and do education, advocacy, and support, we would then have a methadone program, a women's group, this kind of thing. We just get swamped with running an overdose prevention site, which is a service which um, costs almost $1 million a year to run a site like our site, and we're doing it for 80000 We managed to get another grant for 50000 to last until March, and we also got um, uh, a temporary um, reprieve from Island Health of $4,000 a week, which ends on December 3rd, and we'll be back down to four volunteers from 12 volunteers a day. And um, despite pleading, um, it's not our fault that there's nothing in Nanaimo, despite the RFP going out for an OPS, it, nothing set up, there's still nothing set up. And um, I've been assured, I don't know if you guys are in the know more than me, that Canadian Mental Health is going to open a tent. They say November, that gives them 10 more days, or is it nine more days? So I don't, they're not telling me, and um, it will be a huge relief to not have you know, be swamped with so many people. And the way it's run then is there's a steering committee meeting every Saturday at noon. Um, if you got issues, bring it. Um, then we have a volunteer meeting at one. That's for people of the 12 volunteers. We usually encourage newcomers who come there who often have extremely low self-esteem to uh, try to do a volunteer shift and they get a stipend for um, what you'd call working for six hours. And then there's the intermediate level volunteers and then the, what we call the responsible person in charge are volunteers. Then we have a general membership meeting at three o'clock on Saturdays. So and that's so how we operate. Do you have managers, do you have people on site who, who aren't peers, who are not users or is this? No, that's the problem. I asked um, Island Health, I said, you know, this has happened to us. We need a staff person. We need somebody who's paid wages, who can, be totally responsible for setting up, you know, like running the place. And it would be about 150,000 for a, a full-time wage plus relief for that person so they don't go mad. And the, and the funding that you have is from the provincial government through Minister Malcolmson's office. And uh, is, uh, was that an application that you put through? It's an application that goes into the doing? Community Action Initiative. They also fund the Community Action Teams, the CATs. People have heard of the CAT. They fund that as well as a provincial peer network, which is a number of um, peer-run projects. So that was the that was the funding we got for the eighty thousand dollars. And so I've, I'm hearing reports about stronger drugs in the community: lots of benzodiazepine, um, carfentanil, something I can't remember, trans something. Uh, are there? Do you have uh, people overdosing on the site regularly? It's interesting on the site because um, because it's run by and for people who use drugs, there tends to be less overdoses in my observation than a site that's not run by them because there's a certain amount of, 
you know what I mean? There's, there's a huge communication between people. Don't do that. I wouldn't do that much. You know, I saw that. My friend went down on that. There's a lot of communication. And if you look at how a lot of overdose prevention sites are set up, people aren't allowed to speak to each other even on the... So we're hoping that, you know, that we will be able to get people to go to the other site. So we have less, but we had, say, four... Um, two weeks ago, and then some pink chunks came in. We get a little bit of a warning, but um, you know, we did have some people go down, and then they revived on site, and, and the ambulance does come, but usually they refuse to go. Are, are you collecting data on? Uh, yeah, users it's been really tough because you know, like, yeah. what, like, could you t let me know what kind of data that you collect and, and, um, and where that's going? That's the biggest challenge when you've got a lot of people that have very poor literacy skills in charge, you know, the inmates are in charge of the asylum, as it were. And the, um, what we've done is really focused, and we've got a couple of volunteers that are really good. We put up a position where when you're coming in, you need to sign in, <laughs> and that's our data collection. We had a sign-in before, but it would just be, oh, where's the sign-in sheet? And everyone's wondering where it went. So it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it seems chaotic, and then other days you'll realize the whole day went by and there was no problems, which is shocking for a group of people who are so devalued that they, you know, that they can run something that well. No further questions, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, Councillor Perino, then Councillor Hemmings, and Councillor Armstrong. Thank you so much for your presentation, and and I just have a couple of questions for you through your worship. Uh, Everyone is a volunteer? All of the, the staff are volunteers, is that correct? Yes. And, and their background, like what sorts of background would we see from some of those volunteers, like yourself? What? It's interesting. Um, we've just got one who is a mental health and addictions worker. We've got someone else who's run a business. We've got other people whose sole background um, is just being involved in the drug trade and being, uh, you know, I don't know, they, they're pretty, hardcore working class people for the most part, but okay. um, it's interesting. Um, I agree. I mean, I'd, I'd love to sit there and interview them because I'm very curious yeah. myself, but it is a very uh, varied thing. I think um, people who end up um, using drugs in, in Nanaimo and are street involved, would you could say there's more indigenous people involved and there's more yes. uh, people from a background of trauma and jail and foster care and that kind of thing. So they would be, so they would be most of your volunteers would have this background. Yeah, and it's just mixed, you know, people do what they're best at. Some people really just want to sweep, you know. Yes, yes. You get a, someone with a power washer, boy, there's an argument who gets to run that power washer, just saying. Yeah. Is it a 24-hour a day operation? No. How many hours are you open? 12 hours a day. 12 hours a day. Thank you, Your Worship. Councillor Hemmings. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Ms. Livingston. It's nice to see you again. Um, can you tell me the relationship between Nandu and Vandu, please? There isn't a relationship. The, uh, the funding that Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users has was, um, is from the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority. Island Health refuses to fund Nandu, refuses to discuss funding Nandu. You don't know why? No, not, not other than, you know, this little bit of extra funding for a few weeks to bridge uh, uh, waiting for this overdose prevention site. What's happened, I don't know if people realize, they had the places for people to inject, but virtually everyone within a two-year period has stopped injecting drugs and now smokes drugs. So you have a whole different problem, you know, whether WorkSafe BC won't allow workers into tents with smoke. It's, it's incredibly complex almost all the time. The great thing about user-run places is they're nimble and quick-witted. What they lack in um, stability, they make up for in being able to quickly respond to very strange drugs and drug reactions and also to, uh, you know, uh, route of administration, like whether people are um, injecting or smoking, that kind of thing. Thank you. And regarding your funding from the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions through CAI, does that funding have any contingencies placed upon it in terms of good neighbor agreements or operating protocols, et cetera, et cetera? The problem with the CAI funding is also the real strength of CAI funding. The application form is extremely simple and the reporting is extremely simple. 
These are tiny amounts of money. I mean, come on, $80,000 is the biggest amount they give out. Many groups are getting 40 and 20 because they're just, um, they call them peer-led initiatives. They're not even user groups, some of them. We're truly much more of a user group because we constantly meet. If you don't meet every week with the steering committee to see what problems there are and how we're gonna solve those problems and you know what I mean, to keep right on top of it, like what drugs are out there, um, is there have been violence, um, what's gonna happen, you know what I mean, just a constant monitoring of it, which is much more like um, you know, self-help. Um, I don't know, if you, um, what we, I, I don't know how to describe it, it's incredibly, wearing to never have enough money and to never have anyone in charge. I think we really need someone in charge. But um, the, the, my, my real message to the city of Nanaimo is um, we've been trying to have every Friday we meet at 11 a.m. with um, Canadian Mental Health and uh, Mid-Island, who's running the other OPS and will be opening the new smoke tent. Um, and Island Health, and we've asked over and over again, can please, it's a, what you call a problem-solving meeting, um, and we need the city at that meeting, whoever you send us, whether it's bylaws or the, the new community safety approach or um, bike police, we'll take anything. And um, it, because we can't have a sense of uh, dealing with neighborhood issues, you know, what most suggestions from people are is to do more with, la with nothing. No one offers us any more, but they say, you know, you could keep better data, or if you, um, why don't you, you know what I mean? It, it, they're, the more they sort of pile on us, we are really swamped doing what we do right now. And to, um, it's painful to have solutions put to us where there's no funding, but you're supposed to do more. That's been a, a pattern. <laughs> Okay, thank you for that. And, and one final one, if I may. Um, you talk about this service being complex um, and the funding doesn't have any attachments with good neighbor agreements, but can you, can you share with me your um, interest, your, uh, what have been your efforts to engage with the neighborhood, the businesses, the residents around this mm -hmm. difficult service? Anyone who approaches the, um you know, I've finally got the volunteers to understand we have a pamphlet and you should hand it to anyone who asks what we do. Then um, the other, you know, I tend the South End community cleanup. I don't know what else to do. What, what generally those kinds of things are us calling for a meeting at a facility. It would appear to me that South End Nanaimo really lacks community space in order to hold a community meeting. And I look forward to having one because I think the pattern has been to, you know, wait until everything's a crisis. I think uh, we would be operating at a much better um, level than we are operating at if we had any interventions that I pl was pleading for all the way through this process. Um, in no way did we ever think that 200 people a day would come to that site. It would, you know what I mean? And that's considered a huge success. There are many places set up that can't seem to attract the people who are at risk of overdose. And it means that we're seeing overdoses continuing to rise all across the province and actually across the country. So the, I'm just saying that our success should be rewarded for what we're good at and then build on uh, trying to straighten out the weaknesses, which is trying to create some stability and some, um, you know, we need a staff person to do that. Can't just be done with volunteers. Anyway, that's. I know you, I'm not asking you guys for money. I'm just asking you to not phone our landlord and ask him not to renew our lease. I thank don't you, know Ms. why. Thank you, Ms. Livingston. Pardon um, me? I just said thank you for that okay. response. Uh, one final, if I may, and that's, um, I've heard you say t CMHA is opening a service. We don't know if that's actually happening. What is your intention if a new service uh, with inhalation opens in Nanaimo, will that um, precipitate a closure of Nandu? Will that change the service you provide? Maybe we'll become a drug user group. Um, you know what I mean? Be able to focus on uh, what drug user groups do, which is education, advocacy, and support. That's different than supplying a service where people can come in and grab their supplies and use their drugs, which is what a OPS is, an overdose prevention site. So the, the problem being, uh, well, let me put it this way. If Nanaimo 
had five places like this, then South End wouldn't be persecuted. And you know what I mean? You know, just this idea that nobody wants to have a place where 200 people are coming to it every day. As tight as you try and make it, it's still a lot of traffic going to one area. Not car traffic, just saying. There are some cars coming there, but mostly people are coming on foot. Thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you. I'm going to go to Councillor Brown because he's, I think he's had his hand up for a little while. Councillor Brown, on the screen. <clears throat> thank you, Worship, and uh, through you to Anne. Uh, thanks so much for coming and appearing as a delegation. I know this isn't the easiest space to have this type of conversation, so uh, thank you. I have two questions. Um, uh, most of uh, your colleagues have asked uh, similar questions, but the two that I have remaining right now are I'm just curious the level of island health interaction or support for the site through outreach teams uh, or other medical support and if you're able to describe what that looks like and, and the frequency and how much it is. And the second question I have is, um, what is your anticipate, what do you anticipate to happen if the funding ceases and the, the site has to shut down both in terms of impact to the individuals that uh, utilize the site and also the neighboring community? Yeah, um, the NARSIF nurses come on Thursdays at 2 o'clock, I think every Thursday, and um, there's, a, in our teensy little building, there's a private area where they can counsel people and have that privacy. That um, Island Health comes now on Wednesdays, and they've got this fancy new van, but they won't pull it onto our lot, so we're trying to figure out how to get people to um, really go and get their wounds looked at. And um, there's a social worker and make sure people can try and get on disability, welfare, anything, rather than just, um, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement. If we keep thinking about that too. If we shut down, um, even if we open late, there's like people in the alley. And I think that um, if, you know, our funding's discontinued, our lease is up, whatever. There's, if that is something, we need to really have a plan to dismantle because that's a lot of people. And those are people that were using their drugs publicly before and aren't now. They're people that didn't have access to a toilet and do now. We have probably the worst toilet in Nanaimo, just saying, but we have one. And um, there's, you know, they could wash their hands. Like, you know what I mean? And they could meet with these other services. Um, I think that, um, that would be something that I would really hope that South End uh, citizens would say, look, if you're gonna dismantle this thing, make sure it doesn't damage our neighborhood. Because we have to have a way of um, sort of announcing, you know what I mean, how would we? I've, I've been thinking about it already. What if I could get half the people that are using our tent to go up and use the tent that's gonna open, I guess, right next to City Hall. But um, I think, is it, is it really happening? Do you guys know? I just keep hearing rumors. Anyway, whatever. When it opens, um, is anyone going to use it? And if not, how can I get these people to go up there and use it? So it, it starts to become a place they're comfortable. People are comfortable at our place because they're members. They belong. They can vote for the steering committee. They can uh, give their input at the general membership meeting. If there's a dispute, they can come to the steering committee and fight for their rights and you know what I mean? It's got a kind of, uh, you are somebody when you come there, you're a member. And uh, anyway, I think that's why it's attractive. That's it, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Um, thank you. Um, I was, <coughs> excuse me, I was just wondering, are you aware of the impact this site has had on the neighborhood and businesses? Yeah, the, the um, we constantly clean up, so we keep a close eye on garbage and paraphernalia. So I'm always a bit oh, eye rolling about that. But there's garbage and paraphernalia all over in Nanaimo. There's homeless people all over in Nanaimo. There's shit all over in Nanaimo. There's people using publicly all over in Nanaimo. I mean, I've been coming here for two and a half years, and I'm spending more time in Nanaimo now than I am in Vancouver, just sort of sleeping on my friend's floor. But the the um, uh, perception and, and it is a lot of traffic it is a lot of people so th th when I called for a meeting for the newly formed Nanaimo area public safety association could we have a meeting also the south 
and community association. Could we have a meeting? They're not wanting to meet in person. So I don't, you know, I try to keep uh, some emails going back and forth, but um, it's a great thing for neighborhoods to look after their people and also resolve differences and, um, you know, whatever. We're completely trying to do what's best for the people, which includes the people that come to our place. So, And then uh, my last question, because the rest have been asked. Do you know how many people have, that you've seen there that have been referred to treatment or have taken advantage of treatment? Well, that's really interesting because people talk about treatment, but it, um, the topic treatment we almost always think is abstinence-based treatment. Treatment is also um, substitution therapy for stimulants and um, opiates and you know that kind of thing. But I, th because we haven't formed our um, sort of advocacy group to deal with those issues, it's been um, uh, I can almost just I can't speak with authority because I haven't sat through um, sessions, but. For instance, um, AIDS Vancouver Island now has a new enhanced harm reduction program where there's uh, available, I believe, fentanyl. Um, um, you know, it's, it's enhanced. This is good. And then you find out you have to been off methadone for six months to get on it. So it means you have to be not in treatment, and then that's the treatment you're going to get. You can also try to negotiate stimulant prescription there, but it's on an ad hoc basis. You walk in and see if the doctor will let you. So um, it's just, um, how would I put this? Uh, I assume people have, but I don't know if you've ever dealt with 200 people a day. I don't get very much time to really have that individual one-on-one uh, -on -one time. And you know, the purpose of our group is to do that kind of thing with peer support. And you just see kindnesses. You see a woman crying and two other women taking them aside and going into the private room and talking about, you know, you know what I mean? You see what you call peer counseling, but it's a very natural thing. It's friendships and um, not uh, clinical relationships. We don't have, we're not a service. We don't have professionals. And just, just my last question, you kind of touched on it because it's very critical after, you know, when somebody has brought back with Narcan or whatever, that they do get medical support. And we know that they have to go willingly. I understand that when you call the ambulance, they don't want to go. Is there any way that you can work with any of the uh, uh, addictions doctors to maybe come in and do regular checks on that? Has that been looked at? <clears throat> oh, the, our greatest curse at this point is that our meetings are on Saturdays. I can't get anyone to come on Saturdays, with a few exceptions, um, to talk to the general membership. So we're eager to have AVI or anyone doing any services or bylaw officers. We've asked many, many people to come and speak to the, you know, there's about 25 to 30 people generally at a general membership meeting at 3 o'clock on a Saturday. So it's been difficult, but... Um, Get back to that. Uh, say, what is your question again? Sorry. I was just wondering if, if there is any way to get these people because oh. some people that have been Narcan four or five times, yeah. it starts to take a toll on their brains, their their vital organs, yeah. and, and they do need medical intervention. Yeah. So, you know, um, there's a lot of reports that Nanaimo Regional Hospital isn't always friendly with people, and people, you know, have misunderstandings, as I say. You know what I mean? It doesn't go well. If you were going to be transported to a hospital across town because you were gotten narcan and you realized when you got there that every time you've been there you've never gotten treatment, you might not be very keen to go because you're just going to end up walking all the way back across town. So I'm just saying, and um, Narcan causes severe withdrawal right away, right? So we have a real conundrum on our hands, and I don't know what's going to be worked out. I, we've had only conversations with uh, a social worker there, uh, Murphy, I think is her name. Anyway, she was kind enough to zoom in on one of our, during COVID, one of our general membership meetings. And um, there's a long way to go with Nanaimo Regional in terms of saying, if you get there and you're in withdrawal, you're supposed to drive across town, score some drugs, go to an OPS, use the drugs, come back, and then sit in the waiting room again because they're not willing to help you with your withdrawal while you're waiting to see someone. Those are silly things, but they're really clearly, you know, physical problems. You know what I mean? That's, um, anyway. Thank you. Okay. And Councillor Gesselbrook. No. Uh, Ms. Livingston, I have a few questions, if you don't mind. Um, 
Nandu, is it an incorporated society? Not yet. Uh, and how does one join? The uh, membership form for um, the Nanaimo Area Network of Drug Users asks people if they are a user or former user of illicit hard drugs and if they agree with the mission statement of NANDU, which is to improve the lives of people who use illegal drugs through user-based peer support and education. And you have a president, a secretary? We have a steering committee, and um, they're all blanked out on the PowerPoint, or you'd see them. <laughs> um, yeah, we have a steering committee that's elected. Mm -hmm. And we will form a nonprofit society. I challenge anyone to form a nonprofit society with no office. I'm just saying, there's, there, we're really ready to do it. It's just, and so our funding is administrated by Solid in Victoria. And so another administered by who? Solid Victoria. It's a drug user group in Victoria. And they're an incorporated society. They absolutely are. Yes, twenty something years. Yeah. Uh, and how many members do you have? Well over 400. If you can find all the... Well, the problem is the chaos. So uh, there's 400 forms that I can find. There may well be more, just saying. So I, I guess from, for, from my perspective, and I appreciate Island Health has an opportunity uh, to set up a, an overdose prevention site in accordance with the law. It has legal responsibilities and liability. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, from my perspective, if Nandu, its members, its visitors, whoever engage in behavior that is either illegal or unacceptable to the neighborhood, uh, what's the method of sanctioning anybody? That's why we need uh, more structure, for sure. And what is the method for sanctioning? I'm asking you if I, you, you know, are you going to kick them if, out of society? It would appear the method right now is to have um, the owner of the land contacted and urge them not to renew our lease because that is our Achilles heel, right? If we don't have a space, we don't have anything. So I don't know. Um, we'd love to solve the problems and, and move forward because it is a downward spiral otherwise. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I've been clear. It seems to me I have made every effort to meet with the city of Nanaimo over and over and over again, pleading almost that we need uh, a communication and we need to um, have a way of moving forward. The statistics you cited in your report earlier, if I'm not mistaken, indicated that something in the range of two thirds of overdose deaths occur in private homes. Is that accurate? I think it is. It's yes. from uh, Dr. Allison, mm -hmm. yes. And, and so uh, the, the whole point of a site like this is to ensure that someone doesn't die of an overdose, or if they do suffer an overdose, they won't die alone. And you say the numbers are increasing, and, and I'm uh, curious to know, because as you understand, there is a great deal of concern expressed to this council and our bylaw staff and policing forces, et cetera, and, and the death rate is going up. Everyone acknowledges it. Um, what do you attribute that to if, in fact, the majority of people are still overdosing and dying in their private residences uh, and, and not in the streets, so to speak, where they have no opportunity for support or help? Um, I've been at this a long time. I think I'm a big public health expert. The real natural network amongst people who use drugs is the scoring and the market for drugs. We need a safe market and if if um, the drug dealers will buy in and ensure that their drugs are safe then that's great but if you've got someone who's trying to hide their drug use and you know i've seen it before where a truck will pull up not at our current site someone comes out of that truck goes down inside and then goes back up and gets in their truck and goes to work that's somebody who's housed that's somebody who if they're going to be found dead they're going to say oh they they don't need an ops well I don't know whether they need an OPS or not, but they need drugs that don't kill them. And I think that's the way to go, is to network through the drug supply, whether uh, we have to do it like Dolph, which is to, um, it would appear that this public health emergency doesn't matter, even though way more people, and everyone get this, way more people have died of drug overdose than COVID since COVID started and they're much younger. This is a tr terrible tragedy. And um, what we need is, if, if 
it's over basically. People aren't going to grow fields of poppies and harvest them and make uh, heroin and then smuggle it through borders. It's over. They're going to do fentanyl and they're going to keep adding, is it car fentanyl? Is it, I don't, who knows the names? There's like 35 analogs. And each one seems to be worse than the last one. Now they're adding benzodiazepine. So it's this kind of concoction of chemicals. We can't win this. And or that, you know, I've been at this 30 years. It's looking grim, and um, or more grim. And um, I think that um, safe supply is the way it has to go. And we need those public discussions so that people really understand what you mean by it. There is safe supply if you can um, be a person who can be diagnosed as opiate use disorder or substance use disorder. You go to your doctor and you beg them to give you a prescription that doctors are now allowed to give you prescriptions for stimulants or allowed to give you uh, prescriptions for opioids. If you don't have substance use disorder, in other words, you're just someone who uses occasionally and you don't qualify, it's like being an alcoholic, right? When are you an alcoholic and when aren't you? It's usually your friends all know well before you do, but I'm just saying. The equivalent of what they're doing now is saying to somebody who um, drank too much once is go to your doctor and get three weak beers per day or something. You know what I mean? It's hard to make the parallels, but there's some real disconnection to logic, what we're offering people for what we call safe supply. And we need to have safe supply that's really safe supply. Um, you know, I think the end result's going to be that drugs are taken out of the criminal code and it's similar to marijuana and if my kid wants to try cocaine, I can sign out some cocaine for him. At least he's not buying it off the street and dying. And then um, I'm responsible for what I've signed out, similar to poison control. There's certain items that you buy, you sign them out. I don't know if people know this. Anyway, there's many, many uh, huge, robust public discussions waiting to happen. And there's tremendous numbers of resources. And that would be a terrific thing in Nanaimo and everywhere across this province so that we can start to stop having a sort of hysterical abstinence only or prescription only and really get at the real reason people are dying, especially as you just said, in homes who aren't necessarily people who are addicted. And, and if I may ask, of the people who are coming to use your facility, um, are they regular drug users or are they, are they occasional drug users? If you can get me a principal investigator, I'm dying to know. <laughs> I'd love to see an actual project. Uh, let me ask another question then. Are inquiries never made about this of people? Are you not interested in who's coming to your facility? So you should come over one time. You go in, you sign your name, and you wander over to the tent. So there's no interaction with someone interviewing you. That would be a, a staff person. These are volunteers. We've got two people in a tent that usually has about 35 people in it. I'm telling you, when I say this is the busiest place I've ever seen. Right. So you. they're just basically making sure no one's dead, and they hand out the supplies. And then there's another person okay. making sure that the washroom's coordinated, and that's it, skeleton. Just Thank you. And you it. said that you have uh, people from NARSIF coming once a week? Yes. And Island Health once a week? Yes. Any other healthcare professionals coming Sometimes regularly? methadone is delivered to somebody who's got a a pharmacy that delivers. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you guys know this stuff, there's, um, if I was on uh, uh, methadone or methadose or whatever they call it these days, um, I could have the pharmacy, rather than me picking it up and walking all the way to the pharmacy, the pharmacy will sometimes drive it to where I am. And if I say I'm at 264 Nickel, they'll come to 264 Nickel. So I see and, that. And just to confirm also, did, you, did I hear you say that Island Health is, is providing a, a, a stipend of 4,000 a week? Is that, yeah, it's, it's... And when did that start? Um, the beginning of September. So it's September, October, November, and... That's it, We're, there's no, I, I keep saying, is this gonna continue? Because we wanna try and make a plan about what we're gonna do. And I'd also like to know if they're, if, um, it's going through Canadian Mental Health. I, I assume it's because I went to the Island Health Authority board meeting and told them that you can't just leave people for, the RFP came out in January, as you guys may well know, and it's gonna open, I don't know when. If you guys, I mean, I'm, very curious and very affected by it, so I really am eager to know when CMHA is opening their smoke tent and then their whole facility, which is well, very desperately needed. Thank you very much.
Ms. Gurry, my screen's gone entirely blank, so I can't pick up a speaker or notice anyone or do anything. I wonder if some technologically able person can come over here and rescue this council meeting. Yes, and in the meantime, Your Worship, is if any um, councillors had any more questions? No? Yes? No? Magic. Thank you. Uh, and the next, if I'm not mistaken, Ms. Gurry, uh, would be uh, the Nanaimo Area Network of Drug Users topic, and that would be Ruth Taylor to speak about the impacts of NANDU. Ms. Taylor, correct, welcome. And you have you, five Mayor minutes Pro. as well. Thank you. I'll let you know it when you have a minute left. Do you mind if I just grab my phone so I can see oh, my five yes. minutes? Thank you. You ready? I'm ready. Great, thank you. Please. Uh, my name is Ruth Taylor, and I'm here tonight because my family home backs onto Nandu. I'm here as a mother. I'm a citizen of the Métis Nation of BC, and I am grateful to be a resident of Nanaimo. I don't want to be here tonight, but I have to for my family's safety and I love my community. When I say that this site is dangerous, irresponsibly operated, and has greatly negatively affected my home life, I say it as someone who's borne witness to its operations for eight months. I've lived in my location for five years. Before that, we lived in Harewood for nine years. And before that, I lived in the downtown east side in the heart of it for 15 years. So when I say that Nandu's operation has exceeded the safety threshold for any residential or commercial neighborhood, I say this from a place of a lot of lived experience. And again, I say this as a mother. You can see my home and you can see how people have all been blacked out. Pardon me. Uh, call attention to this slide. You can see my property line. You can see my children's trampoline. And you can see Nandu. It's about 10 feet away. <sighs> Excuse me. I want it to be known on the public record that a man was arrested at the Nandu site after threatening my family on November 9th. He accosted my elderly father-in-law outside my home, badgered him about parking, and then vandalized our vehicles. And most disturbingly, he spoke correctly about the genders and number of children who live at my address. He then became so physically violent that he ripped the metal hardware out of my wooden front gate by slamming it over and over again. After this incident, the man walked down the alley to Nandu. This was totally unprovoked, but I do not believe it was random. This large, physically imposing man has a history of violence and was under the influence of a substance. And the officer who arrested him told me that he struggled with the two officers who were sent to arrest this man. I do not doubt, in fact, I, I believe that my family has been targeted by somebody who believes that my concerns and complaints may negatively affect this site. And I'm asking you to do everything in your power to ensure that people like this man are not drawn to and congregating around my family home for the purpose of using illicit drugs. I do not want to come to council again. 
with the information that someone living at my address, including a young child, has been harmed physically or worse. The effects of this site should not be this bad, and it does not need to be, nor does it need to be in this location. This is not about harm reduction versus no harm reduction. This is about Nanaimo having accountable, professional, compassionate harm reduction so that we as a community can mitigate the inevitable negative impacts that occur when people in active addiction with complex trauma, head injuries, and untreated mental illness congregate in any number, but especially large numbers. I am frustrated because although this is a public health well, crisis, indeed an emergency, it appears no one will take responsibility for Nandu's operations. It appears that they operate without any meaningful or genuine oversight. And why is Viha not, Viha not taking responsibility for this health emergency? I have emailed the Honorable Sheila Malcolmson repeatedly with my concerns, and I have received no response even though her ministry is funding Nandu. Excuse me. When I contacted our medical health officer, Dr. Allison, her office told me to contact the coordinator of Nandu, who is a private citizen. Is Nandu expected to oversee itself? I'm done. Um, I was going to give you another 10 seconds, given there was a little problem here, but that's fine. If you're finished, thank you. I have a couple of councillors who want to ask questions. Please, thank you. Uh, in order, Councillors Thorpe, Hemmons, Perino, and Manley. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, Ms. Taylor, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for, for coming and speaking tonight. Uh, as with the earlier delegation, I understand it's not easy to appear in public, and, and obviously you have a, a deep emotional uh, feeling for this topic. Uh, two questions, if I may. One, are you aware of other um, residents or businesses in the neighborhood that have had similar experiences to yours? And secondly, and you touched upon this just at the end of your presentation, uh, have you in fact had any conversations with the organizers of Nandu directly to express your, your concerns? And if so, what was the response? Okay, so other than I know the owner of the Dairy Queen has been having a terrible time with people overdosing in his bathrooms, people openly using drugs, blocking the laneways, um, and those kind of things, I know it's been very impactful on that business, which also is one of the only businesses that you can actually walk to with your family in the South End on Nickel Street. Um, I know he's been having issues. I know other neighbors have been having problems Issues with sleeping, I mean, this, the site is open 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week. In reality, it never really appears to close. There is someone who lives there all the time in a motorhome. Um, the fireworks that were going off, you know, at 12.30 at night, um, you know, things like that. There's a lot of noise violation, bylaw violations. So yes, there are anyone in the immediate vicinity are having issues. Um, when Nandu first opened, they did not do any community outreach and they still haven't. Uh, as for this pamphlet, I've never seen this pamphlet. It could have easily been put in my mailbox, etc. but I've never seen that. Because of my background and where I grew up, I knew immediately once I saw the tents, what was happening, probably back in March, April, I did go and speak to a woman. Her name was either Hera or Sarah or Heather. And I did express that it was a family home and that I was very concerned about what would start to occur. And she gave me a card with her number on it, and I never heard from her, she was no longer working there for a while. So that was really the only thing, was that I had to go down and actually speak to them through the fence. But there was no outreach otherwise. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hemmons. 
Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you very much for coming and speaking. Um, you have sent us videos of someone um, climbing your back fence and, and breaching your yard and coming in, and, and we've had all other neighborhood concerns, business concerns, et cetera. So I say that to contextualize that the neighborhood distress is very real. That's something this council is very aware of. You have shared with me in the past that this service is not also safe for users. Could you explain that, please? Yes, so early on in the, uh, the days of, of this site, in April, we had an incident where a person who had been using Nandu's services was left lying in the alley unresponsive. My husband and young son came across this person and my husband phoned 911. 911 asked him if he had naloxone, he didn't. So he went to the Nandu compound and started asking for help. At that point, the person who was there uh, came out of the motor home. He smelled strongly of alcohol and he was reluctant to come out of the alley and help this man who was unresponsive. At that point, he, he did re know, know that an ambulance was en route. My husband told him, I'm on the phone with the ambulance. He came out from the compound and he physically moved that person, the, the man from Nandu, picked the man up, roughly sort of shook him, and once he knew an ambulance was en route, he started dragging him basically down the alley towards Milton Street. At that point, my husband needed to get home. It was around eight o'clock, it was bedtime for my child. My husband then saw the man from Nandu actually stop ambulance from going down the alley. He met them at Victoria and the alley and intervened and stopped them from going down the alley. So this man never received medical care. I have many more examples, counselor like that. Um, they're in my PowerPoint. Councilor Perino. Thank you. I know this is tough, but it's, really helpful, especially for those of us who are new at this table. And I, I just wanted to tell you that it meant a great deal to hear you speak and to hear your story. So I, I really appreciate it. Just have a couple of questions uh, for you through your worship. So you, knew, you, you said you've, you've really been putting up with this for about the last eight months. Is that correct? Yes, eight months. And did, were you informed that they were coming before they arrived? No. No notice, no, no pamphlet, as you said. Nothing. nothing. Right? Okay. You've had no response um, from our MLA, Sheila Malcolmson, regarding this issue, but you've been in touch with her office several times, right? I've sent more than a couple emails with our CMP file numbers yes. and specific concerns, not just for my family, because my children are genuinely traumatized from what they've been witnessing, yeah. but also for the people using this service. Okay, and uh, did you get any response at all from Island Health? Yes, I did. Okay. So I contacted our medical health officer, Dr. Allison, back in August. Yes. Um, her office told me to contact the coordinator of Nandu and oh, Livingston. Yes. You said that, yes. Now, when I was finally able to speak to Dr. Allison on the phone, yes. after okay. insisting that I actually speak to my medical health officer, she was not receptive to my concerns. And at one point, when I told her about the issues with you know, my children having to witness these things, mm -hmm. she insinuated that when children see these kind of situations, it can build empathy. Okay. And I can tell you that my kids have an age appropriate amount of empathy, but they do not need to witness others' unresolved trauma addiction and mental health breakdowns, nor witness open-air drug deals, fighting, screaming, overdoses, predatory behavior, and all the rest that we witness from our yard. And from personal experience, empathy isn't the only effect of witnessing these things. So no other contact from any other... Okay. No. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Manley, and then Councillor Brown. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, through you. Thank you for being here, Ms. Taylor. Um, 
And I'm sorry that you're you're going through this. I am. I'm really sorry that you're having to deal with this. This is not. It's not appropriate for you and your children to be living right beside this site. And we understand that there is a a crisis in our community. There's a there's a homeless crisis. There's an addiction and mental health crisis, and uh, we're struggling with it. You know, throughout the community, and you're right there facing the front line. So I, I appreciate you coming in here and sharing uh, sharing your experience. Many of the questions that have, that have been asked are questions that, that I already had. Um, I would suggest that you try to actually go to uh, Minister Malcolmson's community office and emails, I can tell you as a former MP and as a current councillor, uh, we get a lot of emails, but actually going and, uh, you know, getting on the phone or going down to the office and talking to, uh, talking to the staff there and, and requesting a meeting to discuss this would be uh, a, next, a next step. And I think it's important for our MLA to hear directly from people who are directly affected uh, by what's happening in the community. And um, we don't have any particular solutions to offer for you at this time. So again, uh, all I can do is apologize. And uh, I don't know if you have more to add that you'd like to add because you're limited to your five minutes and you seem to be cut off by the clock. Yes, um, I would like to add a couple questions. Um, one question is, what is the city of Nanaimo going to do to mitigate the immediate concerns in my alley? Will the community safety officers be going up there? I've never seen one, and I think it might even be outside of their downtown bubble. Um, is the RCMP going to be engaged? where the, the, the bike patrol, for example. Um, the laneways that are constantly blocked by vehicles that are left parked there. Not to mention my other safety concern, which is people using and then getting into a vehicle. So we have actually had to call um, the police because there have been people passed out in vehicles. I mean, arms and legs hanging out. And these people have care and control of a vehicle. I've never seen, RCMP there to to deal with and mitigate that very very serious safety risk. I mean, I have so many ideas about what we could do. Honestly, um, but those are specific things that the city perhaps could do. Um, and I get that this is a multi-level issue, but this needs to stop as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Worship. Councillor Brown, you had your hand up, but I take it you've taken it down. You don't have any questions? That's correct, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Prino asked the questions I wanted to ask. Thank you very much, Ms. Taylor. Uh, pardon me, Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. I just wanted to reintegrate what uh, Councillor Manley said, and, and it really is important that you get that message to Ms. Malcolmson because that's the only way NANDU and places like that are gonna get the proper funding to remove them from those types of sites, as Ms. Livingston said, where we can get them into smaller groups that are more contained, because I think one of the biggest problems is, is the number of people, the lack of controls, the lack of security, et cetera, which is having an impact on everybody, not only the neighborhood, but as you stated, some of the people that are clients there as well. And I know it seems hard to keep pushing it back to you, but we're politicians, they only listen so much to us. They listen more to their constitute constitutions, <laughs> constituents. I, I think it's really, and I know how frustrating it is. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, there has been a, a, a overdose crisis um, announced by the province, which does limit some of the stuff that we can do. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I understand what you're saying, but I am a, I mean, I, I'm not getting paid here to be here tonight. Mm -hmm. I have a full-time job, I have young children, and I am doing the best that I can. It is a part-time job for me to send, you know, the emails that I do to dispatch 911 for people who've overdosed in sight of my children. And I don't want to sound angry, but I do not accept this is my problem and my problem alone, and that I need to go and speak to Sheila Malcolmson. 
she has seen my emails, I'm sure, and if she hasn't, she needs to. Thank you. No, I understand Thank that, you. and I'm very sorry for what you do live through because I do know the toll it takes not only on your children and yourself, your mental health as well for not getting good sleep and for witnessing some traumatic events. I'm very sorry for that. I'm not seeing any further questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Taylor, for taking the time tonight and for your continued advocacy. Thank you. The next is a voice of people on the street, a delegation, Bruni Bruni and Daryl Holm. Good evening, Ms. Bruni. Are you just on your own tonight? It's just me. <clears throat> and you'll have five minutes, and I'll let you know when okay. you have a minute left. Thank Good you. evening, Mayor Krogh and Honorable Councillors. My name is Bruni Bruni. I live on the Salish Sea, and Nanaimo is my ancestral homeland. Since we're all here on unconceded native land, people that have lost their homes for whatever reasons. It doesn't matter. They have nowhere to go. They must be allowed to be somewhere. The way these people are treated is the worst atrocity in our society today in league with the residential school genocide. You move them from place to place to place. Why? That's terrible. I'm, there's many, many empty lands here, empty lots. I'm asking that you designate some area where people can be because you're not going to get rid of them. There's more and more homeless people and it doesn't matter whether they're addicted to substance uses or what. In many countries, there's refugee camps. At least they can cook their own food. These are Canadian citizens. They can't make a cup of coffee. They can't do anything. You judge them with a harsh measure. The federal government gave the city $3 million to help homeless. Where did it go? Ha! Ah, it went to more policing so they could be more harassed. Oh, yes, you did contribute a few toques and socks. You, every one of you here sitting there, you have a responsibility, and I place this on your heart. Sheila Malkinson said she would be happy to help with any kind of funding that's needed. And really, it's the cheapest solution. You don't need a whole lot of funding. Here, you can stay here. Put up a, 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 some garbage containers and a toilet. And maybe, maybe if you feel kind-hearted, you might extend a hydro line so people can have a warming center. Please, I beg you, I beg you, I beg you to put this on priority. It's winter and people are cold. They do not deserve this. Everybody has to have a place somewhere. Give it a try. People talk about homelessness all the time. It's not going away. And all this land is unconceded native land. Do you know what that means? It means it wasn't won in war. It wasn't sold. It was just taken. And maybe people just need to take the land back because we all have a right to live and to life. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any questions. That concludes the delegations unrelated to agenda items. Uh, the next item is 12A, it's snow and ice preparedness. Mr. Sims, our general manager of engineering and public works is going to introduce this. Thank you and welcome. Your Worship, thank you. Council, good evening. Uh, it's our pleasure to be here tonight. Thompson, our Manager of Roads with Public Works and our Manager of Parks Operations with the Parks and Recreation and Culture Department are here and will around uh, our response to city uh, to snow and ice events. So, as you well know, we don't remove snow. Mr. Uh, Thompson, Ms. Davis will will tell you that. But the, one of the things that we don't talk about really is the responsibility that we all have for being prepared for winter. 
the response that you'll see this evening is what the city can do and our main focus is really on emergency routes and opening those up your worship you uh, stole some of our thunder there with your evening uh, your marriage report but we we believe citizens also have a huge role as you pointed out in your report they can help themselves by preparing for winter just as we're preparing our equipment so we, we really ask that uh, folks take transit if they're possible. Most of the transit routes are within 500 meters of our primary routes, or within most people live within 500 meters of a transit stop. We ask that people winterize not only themselves, but their vehicles. So wear winter boots and hats and coats and mitts, just like you were when you were leaving for kindergarten. And I don't know whether you're moving away from the mic or the mic's fading out, Mr. Sims. But yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. So <laughs> I, I just wanted to reference a, um, a quote by one of our fire response to a, 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 a rollover accident on Hammond Bay Road this weekend. And his comment was, when you see the roads are white, that means they're slippery. So just be aware. So uh, that's a pretty good indication it, just to be careful. So I'll pass it over to Ms. Davis and Mr. Thompson. Thank you very much, Mr. Sims. And who's up first, Ms. Davis or Mr. Thompson? Good evening, Mayor and Council. You'll be receiving a joint presentation this evening. Um, we work collaboratively on our snow and ice control and you will be seeing a collaborative presentation. Um, so we do run very separate um, operations to control our snow and ice um, because by means we have different equipments within our fleets but yeah we do work collaboratively to make sure that our service is well connected and that there are efficiencies and synergies uh, made where possible so this evening we'll be presenting to you some information on the resources that we use our practices and procedures We'll be having a look at what happened in the previous winter of 20 21 and 22, and then going over some of our frequently asked questions. So the level of service that we deliver through public works and parks operations is primarily uh, to provide safe passage for emergency vehicles, public transit, and the traveling public. Uh, it is carried out in a manner that balances public safety and city resources and is reflective of best practices and established procedures. Um, we will be coming forward in the new year with a formal policy that will reflect this level of service. And uh, that's based on, as I said, practices, but also recent case law from Marchie versus Nelson. So the, the areas in which we work are vast and numerous. Snow and ice control is looked after on city streets, parking lots, and some bus shelters. City-owned public spaces, including plazas, stairs and bridges, parks, trails and bike lanes, both separated and on the street. And thinking about what the parks operations priorities are and our scope of work, we have three major priorities. Uh, the first one is safety in the downtown. So we want to make sure that everybody is safe, able to get to work, and business is able to happen in our city. So what we do is we make sure, first thing uh, when snow happens, is we clear the police station, and then we head downtown and take care of over six kilometres of downtown sidewalk and over six hectares, hectares of city-owned parking lot and other key civic facilities, including the service and resource centre and city hall. A secondary, uh, secondary priority for us is keeping our rec facilities open and for that we use a contractor to do that service and they are dispatched when we have 25 millimetres of snow in place. And then thirdly, we always want to make sure that we keep that spine trail through Nanaimo open and usable because it's a key active transportation network. And I'm happy that we're able to say that we can maintain it over 15 kilometres of multi-use trail and that you can travel from Woodgrove in the north to Howard Centennial Park in the south through the nine kilometres of ENN Trail, Metro Drive Trails, and the Trans Canada Trail to the Georgia Greenway. Uh, on the public works side, we trigger our operations at 50 millimetres of accumulation, a uh, historically short term event that we're used to dealing with. We just wait for it to melt, let Mother Nature do the work. It's the cheapest, most effective solution that we've got in our toolkit. We do cover a vast area road network over 560 kilometers of roadways over 90 square kilometers 
And notably, our cul-de-sac count has increased by 50% over the last 20 years. So cul-de-sacs and dead ends are our, our lowest priority. They're also the most numerous and most effort uh, consuming activity. We also handle select transit shelters on behalf of RDN Transit. And I would point out that the things that we do not do is provide service to private frontages, so sidewalks in front of residences or businesses, and we do not service laneways. There's a quick map of our routing. Uh, the red routes are priority one routes, so those would be our major transit corridors, uh, transportation corridors, and then moving on to priority two and priority three routes. And as Mr. Sims said, uh, most, the vast majority of residences are within 300 meters of a priority one route. So our practices and procedures, these are based on many years of experience. Um, it's proven to work very effectively in a typical event. So a typical event for Nanaimo consists of an early morning snap freeze. Usually by nine o'clock it's above freezing, but we have to make sure that everybody can get to work safely and effectively. Um, and when we do get accumulation, it's, it's typically gone within a couple of days. So we have um, obviously people and equipment to be able to provide that service, uh, to run a full shift 24 hours a day of snow clearing we require a minimum of 40 people. And uh, this year we've trained 71 people, so we're looking pretty good in that situation. Over in parks operations, we don't have quite the complement of staff to run a rotating shift. So we run once one shift, and we'll generally call in staff on a, on a snowy day uh, around 4.30 a.m. To, to aim to have our facility serviceable by 6 a.m. And that we will run a 12-hour shift in that case. We utilize around 15 pieces of small equipment. Would like to point out some of the climate change impacts that we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, the meteorologists, the scientists and experts are telling us to expect longer, more intense events. And I think that certainly after last year, that is proving to be true. One of the things that we need to watch out for and it becomes a real challenge in these longer events is staff burnout. When we're running two shifts, 24 hours a day, um, after a few days, everybody's starting to get pretty tired. Uh, certainly, I can speak to, to my team. Last year, after two weeks, they were exhausted. Um, also, reduces our resiliency. Um, we don't have the opportunity to maintain equipment quite the way that we would if we had shorter events. And also, in terms of supplies, there's a lot more competition for constrained resources and supplies uh, throughout the province, let alone just on the island. So this is a typical morning. When we're getting ready, we're forecasts have come in overnight to the public works yard and uh, crews are out dealing with the early morning frost. So we have uh, brine for that solution. It's our best tool in our toolbox for that. Some of the other tools that we've got, uh, we have, we're stocked full of salt. We have uh, quite a large supply at Public Works. We've got about 120,000 liters of brine ready to go at any time, and our fleet of trucks is prepared and ready to go as well. And here you can see some of the small equipment and um, tractors that we utilize in parks operations. Our tractors are used in clearing off parking lots, and we also use our mowing equipment equipped with snow plows and snow blower attachments to clear some of those um, skinny areas like bike lanes and um, multi-use paths. Our utility uh, vehicles. Ms. Davis, Councillor Armstrong has a timely question, she hints. The next one? No, no, forward. Oh, sorry. Yeah. One more. So you see that big, large, where the plows have put all that snow? How are we going to deal that Met Mitchell Drive where there's no room for that? Are you going to have to bring trucks behind to collect that snow, or what's the plan for there? Do you want me to take that? Yeah. Uh, the nice thing about Metro Drive is it has very wide boulevards, which is actually a key component of our complete streets engineering standards. Uh, not only does it provide 
a buffer between vehicles and pedestrians and cyclists, allows us to plant trees and do all the other good things. It provides us a place for snow storage. And will it make you make sure that it's low enough so those driving out who already struggle to back out of their driveways are going to be able to see the road both directions as they back into two lanes? Uh, well, they shouldn't be backing onto Metro Drive. Some of them can't. Well, they have to because they're backing out of their driveway. Where do they turn around? Um, I can't speak to every single property on Metro Drive, but certainly backing into traffic is a, is a bad practice. So you're telling them then they have to stop traffic then into back into their driveways if, if you don't want them to back out of their driveways? Uh, I believe the configuration of most properties on Metro, there is room to turn around. I, I, no. Anyways, regardless of that matter, um, it, as a driver, you're responsible for the safe operation of your vehicle and you should really only be merging into traffic. No, I just, my concern is having been to many of these accidents where the snow piles have obstructed visibility, I'm just making sure that we don't do that because each time the city's been found liable on those. So that's just my concern to put out there that it's something we need to be very aware of. Visibility. Thank you. Please continue. Thank you. So just thinking about our equipment, it's great that we're able to utilize our summer equipment, our mowing equipment and have the attachments like the snow blowers and the plows to get out there. In parks operations, we also have regular plow trucks and we dispatch three of those to our partners in, par in public works. Um, you can see here we've got our uh, push behind snowblower, which is greatly effective in our downtown. And now looking at the budget, in 2021 and 2022, we had a combined budget of $880,000. In the 2021 snow season, um, we spent 1.45 million, and this year to date, we have expended $645,000 on the snow earlier this year. And we also carry a strong reserve of approximately $1.2 million. Um, I would point out that it's almost impossible to budget for a snow season. From my perspective, this is all risk money. You could budget zero. We're gonna spend whatever it takes to keep the city moving and moving safely. So what happened last year, we'll take a little quick opportunity to review last year and sort of the extraordinary events that we uh, that were faced with. Going into the holiday season, uh, we were looking at forecasts. Average temperature was right around zero. It was a coin toss as to whether it was going to be above or below zero. So we were out pre-treating on the basis that it was going to be below zero. Um, we got rain instead of snow. And then the temperature dropped and we got absolutely hammered with snowfall. Uh, between Christmas Eve and Boxing Day, we got over a foot of snow. We were running 24-hour day operations. Um, we have lots of staff who didn't get their Christmas or New Year's holiday until mid-January. Uh, they chose to spend it driving snow plows rather than opening presents with their kids. Um, and temperatures were considerably colder than average. There's some pictures. Uh, Rutherford Road, December 26th, that is a priority one route. So you can see the tire tracks. Um, Fillinger Crescent, down by the ocean, rarely gets snow. They got uh, over two feet of snow. And Cather's Crescent up in uh, near um, Westwood Lake, again, uh, lots of snow there. So this just illustrates the importance of being prepared for winter. There's only so much that the city forces can do and we really do rely on residents and travelers making wise decisions and being prepared. Um, luckily, it was Christmas and people had the option not to go lots of places, so that really helped us out. Uh, we also have lots of roads with cars parked on both sides, as Mr. Sims says. It makes it very difficult to get effective snow clearing in those kinds of conditions. Would encourage uh, residents where possible to park in their driveway in anticipation of a storm, that certainly is the best solution for us and where that isn't possible, um, parking on opposite sides of the streets on alternate days. Uh, one thing I would like to point out, the snow plows, they work like a squeegee. They're not designed to scrape material off the road surface. They will brush loose material off the top, then behind we apply salt, we wait for that to work, and we keep clearing layer by layer. Eventually you get down to a point, and this is what we ended up with last year, where there was a thick layer of ice bonded to the road surface. And um, it was impossible for traditional snow clearing equipment to move. And so we brought in um, 
backhoes to clear out some of those areas where they could actually dig down um, to the asphalt. So some of the operational challenges that I alluded to, we had temperatures that were much lower than normal. Um, pavement temperature was minus 11. Air temperature was much closer to zero. So it was a big difference in, in that uh, situation. Ongoing accumulations, day after day after day of repeating events. Uh, residential road configurations, be it street parking as we talked about, also steep slopes. We've got a lot of roads around Nanaimo that are quite steep. Um, recognize that it's um, safety first. If we're feeling uncomfortable trying to service those roads, best to stay off them. Uh, we also run into situations where businesses and residents clear snow from their property onto the roadway. So we've been through, cleared the roadway, and then we end up with a lot more snow put back that we weren't expecting. Obviously, a traveling public's not expecting either. And the expectation of clearing to bare pavement. As I talked about before, sometimes that's just not achievable. So compact snow is an expected condition in the winter. We face some challenges, or the similar challenges in parks operations. And this past storm with 12 consecutive days of snow, there really wasn't any other work getting done in parks operations. So there was a great opportunity cost to that event, but all of our assets were snow covered. And then one of the other things we found is the increasing cost of contracted services due to insurance costs. So last year, we weren't actually able to um, secure a contractor for our snow and ice removal in our facilities. And we were able to handle that in-house. And, and we learned a lot by doing that. So we have reduced our reliance on a contractor, and yet we have secured a service for this year, although the hourly rate is three times what we had prayed in previous years. So some of the operational adjustments that we've made based on that learning from last year is we have increased our contract for supply of salt. We have limited, we have sufficient but limited capacity at Public Works and our contractor has agreed to hold reserve for us. Um, we also will use heavy equipment more readily to access difficult areas instead of snow plows. We'll make an operational decision as to when that's an effective use of that resource. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at is weather stations. Give us actual on the ground visual uh, condition monitoring at key locations around the city uh, we've looked at three locations so far, and we think that project might cost about $75,000 to implement. It's not yet budgeted, but it's definitely a discussion that we'd like to have as uh, 2023 rolls along. And in parks operations, we're looking to decrease our vulnerability to vehicle downtime, and one of the ways in which we're going to be doing that is by replacing some of our mowing equipment, and that is in the capital plan for next year. And also, our new utility vehicles are working excellently to clear our multi-use network. Um, so looking at some of the communications that we've done, we attempt to proactively communicate with those who have questions. And we did some consult consultation with the Accessibility Committee, which I think was went down quite well. And I was glad to be able to attend that meeting and hear questions from those um, who have mobility concerns, who may have different needs and different ways of, of thinking and different needs to access our facilities. And so we took on board some of their feedback, which was, uh, was good to do. And it's actually changed some of our, our operational practices just in terms of simple things of where we might shovel snow and you know are we thinking about having um, disabled parking spaces right next to a facility making sure that those are cleared first and easy things but things that might not always come to the front of staff's mind so it was good to do that and then we continue with our ongoing proactive communication through a variety of channels and uh, the city of Nanaimo maintains an active Facebook and Instagram account Twitter as well also the Nanaimo recycles app if you have that and your garbage is going to be missed that day the app will ping and let you know that your garbage is going to be missed and you might put it out the next day. Voyant Alert is our emergency app, which I would recommend everybody download if they could be made aware if there's an emergency situation relating to snow. Nanaimo.ca is always kept up to date and we also communicate with the media who will be policing updates on the radio and on the TV. And then what you've got there is an advertisement detailing our services in the rec guide, which is available online today. And here are some of our frequently asked questions. Uh, the most frequently asked question is when, when will my street be plowed? Um, as I mentioned, we have a plan in priority order, so uh, priority ones, twos, and threes. And 
uh, as I said, most residences in Nanaimo are within 300 meters of a priority one route, so that's good news. And uh, why is the e &N trail cleared before my street? This is an interesting one, and um, really the answer is, and we try and maintain a, a synergistic operation here, and really the answer is, is about the equipment and equipment availability. So the e &N trail is ploughed using um, utility vehicles. These vehicles would not be used to plough a road, and so when they're available, it is a priority two, and we're generally able to get there after the downtown. And so it may well be cleared before a priority two street or, or some of the cul-de-sacs, absolutely. But it is really, really important that we maintain that um, active transportation spine through our city. Uh, the next question we get is, why does the plow push snow on my driveway? I think this question came up last year as well. Uh, so we would encourage residents. We've got a couple of tips and tricks. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. We've seen many, many situations. Uh, our advice to the residents is to minimize the potential for this when you're plowing, when you're shoveling out your driveway shovel the snow to the right side when you're looking at the road that because the plow will be coming from the left side so any material piled up on the left side of your driveway will end up in your driveway so if you put all the material on the right side of your driveway you won't be affected nearly as much and that will help with visibility as well to councillor armstrong's point now thinking about cyclists, what can cyclists expect this winter? Our separated bike lanes are maintained as a priority too by Parks Operations, so that is the bike lane along Front Street, um, the e &N Trail through to Metro Drive, and also um, the section of Bowen Road from Island Highway to Labio. And so we maintain that as a priority too. And we, we try to get there within the morning of a snow event. It is not something that we guarantee, but after the downtown is cleared, we head to those areas. And I would expect everybody to please remain safe. We won't be able to get it back to black and we will be able to clear a, a narrower path than is, normally pa than is normally available, but it should absolutely be safe and passable. And finally, uh, sidewalks. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it is the responsibility of the property owner to clear sidewalks. Um, we take responsibility for the city sidewalks um, and we would ask that residents and homeowners and business owners uh, be part of the community and help out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Armstrong. Two, two questions if I may. Councillor Manley and Perino in order. <laughs> First of all, I just wanted to say, I think last year you guys did an amazing job. I think the crews did, did great work and, and it was really well done, contrary to what some people think. I think people forgot that you had to keep going back to clear emergency routes. So, But a point that came up, and I know Mr. Sims had answered this for me, but I wanted to put on the public record that when there's a situation when an ambulance needs to go to a street that hasn't been plowed, such as Stevenson Point, they do call, right, for assistance, is that correct? Absolutely, we've got uh, key contacts with all the emergency services. Uh, whether it's fire, ambulance, or police, and if they need to get access into an area that we haven't yet cleared the snow from, we'll divert resources to assist. Thank you. And, and actually, I have two more. And then my second one is, are you looking at cross-training cross cross different people to do the driver's jobs? Because you said that staff burnout is a concern, and I know in the past there used to be some cross-training. Is that being looked at again, or is it happening? We train everybody who volunteers. So as I said, we've trained 71 people so far this year. So that is uh, the bulk of our public work staff plus a significant portion of the park okay. staff. Um, so pretty much yeah. a large proportion of our outside staff is engaged and ready to go. And then my last question, and, and it goes back to one of our uh, pedestrian advocates that, that requests like, um, when they clear your sidewalks, then the plow comes by too fast and sprays the sidewalks back. Is there something that can be done to mitigate that other than slowing the vehicles down? We advise our drivers to aim for 20 to 30 kilometers an hour. That's sort of the optimal speed for clearing snow that helps mitigate those kinds of situations. Um, but eventually the snow is going to end up on the sidewalk, whether it gets there, you know, when exactly when it gets there uh, is, is a question. But when you're clearing a sidewalk, you can clear it behind the property, behind the sidewalk, rather than push it back out onto the road, that will certainly minimize any impact of, of future ongoing snow clearing events from the road. Great. And, and thanks again. Like, I think you did amazing work last year. Thank you. Councillor Manley. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, I also reiterate the amazing job that uh, they did with snow removal last year, although I did find uh, one disappointed person 
on one of your secondary routes through uh, Bowen Park on the bike path, uh, trying to cross country ski after the sidewalk had been plowed, the bike path had been plowed. <laughs> so it was unfortunate for them, but fortunate for me. Um, I'm curious about some of the sidewalks, like along Wake Asaya, where um, you know there's the new development or where there's the apartment buildings. Who's responsible for clearing uh, the sidewalks in in those areas? Because it's not there aren't houses fronting right on. And I, I know I think the new development at Hawthorne, they're going to have their backyards onto Wake Asaya, and then with the apartment buildings, who's responsible for taking on those sidewalks? Uh, technically the sidewalks that are adjacent to the property are the property owner's responsibility, whether it's a frontage or a rearage. Okay. I had the same question that uh, Councillor Armstrong had about the speed of uh, and clearing sidewalks, because I've cleared sidewalks and then had to plow come by and go, mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Councillor Perino. I guess we should, uh, we should be grateful, Your Worship, that we're not living in New York I mean, six feet of snow is <laughs> quite a bit different. But I just not just reasons of snow, Council. Oh, I know. Uh, one question through you, and, and that is, I was surprised to hear that the hospital was not on your list of top priorities. I would have thought Boundary as well as Dufferin Crescent and, uh, you know, the backside. Um, it just, I was surprised that that was not, like, right there in, in uh, your list. The hospital area is definitely a priority Is it? Area. Okay. Um, off the top of my head, I can't tell you exactly which streets around there, but I would yep. expect that access to the emergency department. At That's right. Would be That's right. I just didn't see it in your list, and so that I was I was just surprised. But the explanation as well on why you do trails because of the difference of equipment, that makes sense. I didn't I didn't think of it, but I was thinking the same thing. Why you know, as much as I'm a walker, you're not going to walk when it's cold and wet and snowy. But it makes sense. Makes sense. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, I might, I might note that um, Sorry. the uh, Parks Department actually started clearing the ENN Trail many, many years ago, and it was it actually got people from walking on the highway. <laughs> this is the reason why it was such a high priority for, for the, getting the reestablished. Sorry. We'll actually get people in a, to travel in a safe manner. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, and I don't want to prolong this, but uh, I know every year you get complaints from the public because we get them too. And sometimes I can understand the frustration, and sometimes, quite often, the complaints are, are irrational or unjustified. Uh, so, in advance, I want to thank you for uh, your coming efforts this winter. Hopefully it won't be too severe uh, a winter for snow but I know that city workers do their absolute best uh, in a professional manner to keep our citizens safe, and, uh, and I appreciate that. And I have to say that I live on a cul-de-sac, so I don't expect to see a snowplow. Um, but that leads me to one comment that, that maybe is worth mentioning, because if I remember correctly, last winter we, we did have several repeat events. So, I think some residents had, had trouble understanding why after three or four or five days their side streets were still not getting cleared. It was because you covered the priority one routes and then before you could get on to the priority two or three routes we had another snow event and you had to go back to the priority one routes. Am I correct in that? That's correct. All right. So. I guess I'll just have to get my cul-de-sac uh, relabeled as priority one, but I don't see that happening. But again, seriously, thank you. You, you and your crews do a great job. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Davis, Mr. Thompson. And, and I must say, Councillor Armstrong, I, I, I just want you to know in light of your concern about backing out onto roads as someone who's driven nose in in his driveway for 39 years, I will think of you every day when I back out onto Bay Street which is troubled by 1,500 plus cars a day, and I'll do my best. Thank you. <laughs> Not when I shovel my driveway. <laughs> now, the next is remedial action requirement, request for reconsideration, and for 5 Durham Street. Mr. Lindsay, please. Thank you, Worship. I'll just do a brief introduction here. I know we have the, um, the property owner. Requesting the uh, reconsideration, but just some background for council. 
So, so this is a property that staff have been dealing with since the summer of 2020 in terms of illegal construction, and it's previously been the subject of uh, council's approval back in 2021 to put a notice on title of the property for construction without a permit. And we were in front of you more recently uh, seeking your direction with respect to remedial action order. So uh, earlier this fall, council approved a remedial action order requiring the property owner to take action or have the offending portions of the construction removed. As per the legislation, the owner is given the ability to appeal that decision and that's what they've done. So they're here this evening uh, to, to uh, seek that reconsideration by council and are, are here as a delegation, I believe, after which I'm happy to take any. Uh... Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do we have Gabriel Reinhold here. Please, and uh, five minutes, Ms. Gurry, is that correct? Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Yes, Ms. Reinhold, uh, you'll have five minutes. When you're four minutes in, I'll give you a signal. You've got a minute left, if necessary. Oh, it's okay, I'm gonna thank you. real brief. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say that we finally, finally, finally um, got all the designs and the professional reports in that we needed to that um, for a building permit. And we submitted that last Thursday. And then um, Friday, I spoke to Andrew Brewer, and he said that he got it and that it looked good. And um, today we had, I think, what he called the final um, inspection, where they came and took pictures. So we're waiting for our um, building permit to um, make everything conform as it should be. Is there anything further you wish to say? Okay. All right, any questions for Ms. Reinhold? All right, thank you very much. Mr. Lindsay, anything in response? Uh, Your Worship, I, I can certainly confirm that we did um, um, and thank you, get a building permit uh, application, I understand, last week, and I understand staff, we're in attendance at the site today. Of course, that's always the intent with these files. <coughs> so we don't do this for the purpose of, um, um, of fines or fine revenue. We do it simply to bring buildings into compliance, and whenever property owners are working with us to do that, it's appreciated. So in this case, it's taken a considerable amount of time. The remedial order that council has issued talks about uh, action being taken within 30 days. And from staff's perspective, as long as the building permit is submitted and they continue to work, um, obviously continue to work with. The microphone seems to be cutting in and out. Um, as long as they continue to work with us to finally get to the point where we can issue that permit, then there'll be no need to proceed with the remedial action order. Uh, but at this point, Your Worship, we would, we would recommend no changes and. and uh, Sorry, Your Worship, it seems they still haven't fixed those microphones. Sorry. So for the record, it's not my fault, is what you're saying. I didn't think both you and Mr. Sims could be fading out in the same evening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Armstrong and then Councillor Thorpe, please. Actually, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Oh, sorry. I'm losing my brain today. Mr. Lindsay answered my question about just stay status quo. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your, thank you, Your Worship. And I just wanted to confirm what I think I just heard Mr. Lindsay say, that even under option one of the staff recommendation, uh, the uh, delegation would still have 30 days to be in compliance. Your Worship, again, the, the order says, um, to take action and it's always our intent of course to have the permits issued wherever possible and to have the buildings legalized so as long as there's active uh, work being undertaken by the owner to do that we would say we would consider that as taking action and we would take no further no further action with respect to remedial action order unfortunately this file has been going on for a couple of years and if I got to the point where there was no action being taken or no responses to our um, request for information, then we would, we would be able to um, proceed with that order. And that's what, that would be our recommendation. Thank you, and that, and that was my, going to be my next comment, that this, this file has been in front of us for two years. So I, I think 
I think 30 days more is reasonable enough. But I recognize there's no motion on the floor yet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Perino. Uh, Your Worship, I was just going to ask you a question for a clarification. So are, are we suggesting that, uh, Mr. Lindsay, you're not looking for a motion at this time then, that we're basically let it go for 30 days and see how it resolves itself? Is that is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I'm just confused as to yeah. the next move. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, um, Three Worship, I should have been more clear. That, uh, that's it, you keep fading. <laughs> Fading in and out. Um, yeah, he should change desks. I, I'm not sure if that one's going to work any. Well, maybe it will. Three times. We'll, we'll, give, it, we'll give it a shot. Sorry, Your Worship. No. I, I can just explain. I think what Mr. Lindsay was going to say, um, Councillor Perino, is that option one um, is the recommended option, which is that Council confirm the following resolution that was passed on October 3rd. Is that correct, Mr. Lindsay? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Do I hit that button? Oh. Thank you. I think for the purposes of those who are watching at home and interested in this, the motion is that Council simply confirm the resolution that was passed, which says, amongst other things, direct staff or its authorized agents to take action in accordance with Section 187 of the Community Charter without further notice and at the owner's expense if the said remedial action is not undertaken within 30 days of council's resolution. Uh, it would appear in the circumstances that in fact the own, uh, uh, Ms. Reinhold speaking on behalf of uh, Jan Bernier, they have undertaken action, correct? Your Worship, that, that is certainly how we would interpret it. And again, as long as they continue to take action and work with us, there'd be no need to enforce with the remedial action order, so. Thank you very much. Yeah, move option one. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? Not seeing or hearing any. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Thank you very much. The next item is development variance permit application numbers DVP414 dash 1213 Princess Royal Avenue, DVP 436 6675 Maryland Drive, DVP 437 1835 Bowen Road, and DVP 438 4275 Rutherford Road. Mr. Lindsay. Thank, thank you, Your Worship. I'm continuing music. Mr. Lindsay, are you old enough to remember little Abner and Joe Bell's flug, the little guy who had the cloud above him all the time? Okay, hey, so it is your fault. <laughs> You're just destined for the big podium. I, I give up, Your Worship. So um, what I was going to say is uh, the next few items on your agenda, I'll turn it over to Mr. Hone, who hopefully has a microphone that works, and if not, we'll bring him up to the... Uh, to the podium here, uh, just to do a brief introduction on the on the remaining items under reports. Mr. Holm, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, so the first item um, here I'm introducing tonight, a development variance permit. It's actually uh, four development variance permits for four properties. Same same uh, topic though. So uh, what's proposed here, uh, a sign bylaw uh, variance and um, this is for uh, McDonald's restaurants uh, in, in town on uh, Princess Royal, Mary Ellen Drive, Bowen Road, and Rutherford uh, Road. And uh, the proposal is to um, uh, allow uh, LED uh, menu board signs at these four uh, McDonald's restaurant locations. Uh, these are, uh, so they're pre-sale and menu board signs that are proposed to be uh, LED. Uh, the sign by law does not allow uh, what, what's um, uh, referred to as automated changeable copy on signs without a variance uh, through to the sign by law. Uh, council had previously adopted, uh, council has a policy in place to guide consideration of variances uh, for those types of signs and uh, the proposal is consistent with council's uh, LED and animated signs development variance permit guidelines. Um, you can see the subject properties on the uh, the overhead. Uh, if you could bring up attachment uh, E, please, you'll see the uh, uh, type of sign. They're all similar, the same for each uh, location. Thank you. 
and uh, uh, staff support the proposed variance as it's consistent with um, uh, council's policy that guides these de decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Armstrong, you're just left over from before. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak with respect to this matter? Anyone present in the audience tonight? I'm not seeing anyone. Councillor Hemmins, do you care to make the recommended motion? I'll move the recommended motion, thank you. Seconded Councillor Perino. Any discussion? Councillor Brown. Uh, thank you, Worship. I would encourage Council to vote against this. Uh, I've spoken about this before, but I would note that in the newly adopted city plan, C1 point, policy C1.8.4, talks about the continue to support dark sky principles balanced with safety considerations for new and upgraded buildings and developments. There is no safety need for this sign, uh, so there is nothing to balance. If you truly support the city plan, uh, and the dark sky principles are not just words on a page, then there's no need uh, for this particular sign. So I would, in line with city policy and, and dark sky principles, I would encourage council to vote against this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. And I would just point out, if I read the report correctly, that these are not, and we just saw a picture, these are not large uh, signs facing outward to the roadway, which would be a distraction to drivers, but instead are very small menu signs uh, simply at the side of the drive-through lane, which in fact uh, presumably would help a more efficient flow of uh, traffic through the drive-through, which, which would be good. So I will be supporting this. Thank you very much. Councillor Armstrong. A clarification from Mr. Holmes, please. Um, we heard uh, Councillor Brown's comments about the guidelines, yet you stated that uh, this actually confirms with our guideline policies on LED signs. Is that correct? Uh, through your worship to uh, Councillor Armstrong, it is consistent with our, uh, the um, council adopted policy that guides uh, decisions on LED and animated sign variances. That's Thank you. true. And if I might add to, uh, this is replacing uh, existing backlit signs as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Perino. Well, actually, thank you, um, Councillor Brown. I, I was looking at the same thing as well and concerned about the lighting, but the background in this is actually black. So I think it'll really reduce the amount of light that it has, and so I'm, I will be voting in favor of it. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Manley. Yeah, I have a question for Mr. Holmes for you, Your Worship. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering about the, the amount of light coming from these signs with the, the uh, Will it be the same intensity of the existing signs or will it be more intense? Um, sorry, through your worship uh, to uh, Councillor Manley, I can't um, answer uh, the relative uh, brightness uh, question. Apologies for that, but uh, it, does, it is consistent with um, the allowable um, intensity that's, that's provided for in, uh, in Council's LED and animated sign uh, variance policy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Worship. I won't belabor the point, but I would just note uh, that Council's existing policies are not dark sky friendly. Uh, and the language in the city plan around continue to support is really not accurate. Uh, existing, pol there's a whole host of uh, types of lightings that are dark sky friendly. Uh, I would encourage Council uh, even if you vote in favor of this tonight, to explore what that actually looks like, uh, to be better informed for future decisions, because uh, uh, yeah, there's a there's a whole host of there's a whole body of work on this. Uh, it's very common, um, and there's great examples within the region where you can see what that looks like. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. I just say, well, I understand what Councillor Brown's saying. I've actually seen these signs, and they're far less bright than than the, the ones that presently exist. So I believe these are actually an improvement, and they use a less far less electricity. Thank you. Notwithstanding my cheeky remarks about backing out of my driveway, I'm going to agree with Councillor Armstrong tonight in her position in this particular motion, and and I'll be supporting it. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? 
Yes. Uh, in favor, Councillors Armstrong, Hemmons, Krog, Thorpe, and Perino, and opposed, Councillors Heastmere, Gesselbrock, Brown, and Manley. Motion carries. Thank you very much. I think we're close enough to the nine o'clock. Well, we are according to that clock. Yes. Ms. Gurry, so we'll take a 10 minute break. Yes, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Our emergency routes, they are priority routes. They consist of roads that go to and from the hospitals, uh, from the fire department stations, and from the BC ambulance stations. They're also their main commerce routes through the city of Nanaimo. So this allows uh, commerce to happen during a snow event. So we hit those roads first. Once those are clear and open, then we move into the secondary roads, and then we move into the residential areas, which are dead end roads and cul-de-sacs. And it can take up to 96 hours before we get into the residential areas. One of the uh, side effects of plowing snow is it does end up on the sidewalk and this can be very frustrating for homeowners and business owners that have just cleaned the sidewalk. Uh, it also pulls into their driveways. The crews try to keep it as close to the curb as they can, but we need to open the road right up to the curb to allow the drains to be exposed for when the snow starts to melt. larger winter maintenance vehicles. They're very versatile in that they can be equipped with a lot of our different pieces of equipment. Right now this one has a front plow, a belly plow, as well as a salter or spreader box. We also have a brine unit that fits into this vehicle. This is the belly plow and it's really good at removing hard packed snow and ice. And then back up here to the front we have what everyone is, is more familiar with. This front plow can push a lot of snow, so make sure that you slow down and keep your distance from the vehicles to ensure safety. We have 17 vehicles that uh, we use within the snow and ice operations for the city of Nanaimo. We also have an early shift that starts at five in the morning, and we have a night patrol, an afternoon shift, and an evening shift. They are eyes on the road, keeping us appraised of the conditions so that when the snow starts falling or ice starts farming on the roads, they can start salting and also call for other resources and mobilize the crews out.
This is one of the City of Nanaimo Public Works snow and ice control vehicles. And this is actually set up for a brining unit right now, or anti-icing. And what brine is, is a 23.3% sodium chloride solution. And uh, it comes out of the spray bars down here at the bottom, and it's made here at the Public Works Yard. It's a proactive method of snow and ice control, as when we know that there's a winter storm coming, we can actually lay this down on the road prior to the event. By putting the brine down before the snow comes, it, uh, it buys time. It lets us get on the roads and then when we hit it with the plows, it doesn't stick. The snow doesn't stick, it comes off much easier. Whereas if we didn't brine, the snow has an opportunity to freeze to the road. So another benefit of the brining or anti-icing unit is that during the frosty mornings, we can have it drive down the road and then immediately the frost disappears as they're applying the brine. Brine's a great tool for us. It's uh, very cost effective. We can stretch our, our, our hard pressed uh, tax dollars to the maximum. Uh, we can make brine for uh, cents on the dollar. So the other thing that we ask is that everyone stays back from these anti-icing or any winter maintenance vehicles as it's, they have limited visibility and it's poor conditions out there and they're trying to maneuver around everything. So just stay back and give them a little bit of room to operate and clear the roads. So here we are in the public works yard, city of Nanaimo, and uh, what you look around you can see our various tools that we use for snow and ice fighting. We have uh, tandem trucks, 4x4 trucks, we have backhoes, all our trucks are capable of having front plows on them, and the larger trucks we have uh, belly plows on them as well, and they all have a salter sander that can be mounted on the back. This is another tool in our winter maintenance fleet, it's a salting machine. And what happens is that the salt gets loaded into this hopper. And on this conveyor where it gets hit with these two saddle tanks, which are full of brine. Then it comes out here on the spreader. And why we add the brine is that it reduces the amount of uh, spray from the salt. So it doesn't bounce nearly as far, saving about 20 to 30% of our salt. As well, by using the anti-icing liquid on the salt, the activation starts right as it hits the road. The purpose of the salt is A, to keep the roads bare, keep ice from forming on the road. Again, safety for everyone, including ourselves and the public. Uh, that's why we put the salt down. Today we're talking about clearing catch basins or road drains on residential roads. The first thing to understand is where the catch basin is in proximity to your residence. When clearing a catch basin or road drain, we want to make sure that you make yourself visible and aware of oncoming traffic. When clearing snow or debris from a catch basin, we ask that you put it in an area where it will not plug the catch basin again, not placing it on an already shoveled driveway or sidewalk. Sand, sandbags are available at 2020 Labio Road 24-7. Just remember to make sure you bring a shovel. The City of Nanaimo and Public Works appreciate your help in keeping your catch basins clear. Thank you.
On snow days like this, the city of Nanaimo sends out a fleet of plows. How well equipped are these trucks? Oh, they're really well equipped. We all have plows and sanders on them. Um, we come with a belly plow too. So we're well prepared once we get a big snow like this. A lot of waves, a lot of friendly faces. People are pretty happy when you uh, come and rescue them and clear off their road. So on our maps to determine where we go, we follow our red routes, which are our bus routes and our major routes, and they're first. Then our secondary routes are in purple, followed lastly by our side streets, which are in yellow. We try not to cover a nicely shoveled driveway, but sometimes we don't really have an option, and it's unfortunate. We're not trying to do it on purpose. In some cases, the plows can't scrape heavily packed or iced snow right down to the surface of the pavement. So how does it clear away? We're taking off as much as we can, and then we're putting lots of salt down to, to melt the rest. So sometimes it just takes a little bit longer, but it's uh, usually pretty effective. Salting is really important because um, if we get it down like this, then uh, roads won't freeze and uh, way safer for the drivers out there. And in terms of safety and getting the job done, are there some challenges to plowing in Nanaimo? Yeah, Nanaimo's got a lot of hills, uh, a lot of narrow streets, cars parked on it. It can be pretty tough sometimes. How can drivers parking on the side of the road in Nanaimo help? Just make sure they're parked legally and as close to the curb as possible so we can widen the streets as much as we can. We don't always move very fast, but um, that's important to push the snow, so we really appreciate if people can give us a little bit of space. These are big trucks. We have um, salters going, spinning, and we're still on a lot of ice and snow, so when we try to go up a hill, if people are right behind us, it can be dangerous for everybody. So we appreciate if everybody can give us some space behind us, and we'll give lots of space in front. Tiana? Hey. This sure is the coldest rink in town. <laughs> Whoa! Yeah, buddy! Nice save, James! <laughs> wow, your goalie is keeping you guys in the game. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, 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 man, that's hot. Sorry. That's the way I like it. Oh. oh. Go, 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 go! go. Site survey will show you what's proposed, but uh, minor rear yard variants from uh, 7.5 to 6.19 meters, and then uh, a minor lot coverage variance from 40 to 41 percent to allow a small sunroom addition. And I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holm. I don't suspect we're going to have a lot of questions on this. Councillor, is anyone here who wishes to speak to this matter? I'm not seeing anyone. Moved by Councillor Hemmons, seconded by Councillor Perino. All those in favor? Any contrary? None. Motion carries. Thank you. The next is Development Variance Permit Application Number DVP 4400-2592, Departure Bay Road. Again, Mr. Holm, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, um, again, another minor variance uh, request. Uh, this is related to a minimum uh, flanking side yard setback uh, to be varied from four meters to two meters. Uh, for proposed uh, single uh, dwelling unit on uh, property at uh, 2592 Departure Bay Road, uh, which is adjacent to uh, unconstructed road within uh, Strongeth Arm. Uh, attachment C, the site plan will show you, um, you can see the property on the overhead and there's the uh, survey plan showing the uh, proposed location. Uh, two dwelling units are, are supported on the property of this size uh, given the zoning and a requested flanking side yard uh, variance is requested for uh, the one closest to the unconstructed road, as you can see uh, overhead. Happy to take questions, thank you. 
Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any questions. Is there anyone here wishing to speak to this item? Not seeing anyone. Councillor Hemmons moves the recommended motion. Councillor Manley seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. The next is rezoning application number RA 477-5645 and 5655 slash 5657 Metro Drive. Mr. Holm again, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this rezoning application is from uh, DHK Architects and uh, it's uh, rezoning from uh, R1, two existing parcels. One is zoned R1, one is zoned R4. And the proposal is to rezone to R6 with site-specific uh, floor area ratio of 0.75 and uh, site-specific maximum uh, permitted building height of 13 meters. And the request is su to support a um, the, in concept. And if you could please bring up um, uh, attachment uh, C, you'll see conceptual building uh, renderings there in concept, what is a, uh, a 22 unit uh, ground oriented uh, residential development on Metro Drive. Uh, this is in keeping with a couple of themes that we've talked about um, uh, this past year and one is in relation to development along Metro Drive. You're seeing um, uh, investments in the complete street along Metro resulting in uh, desire for uh, development like this and uh, housing form in a ground oriented uh, multifamily um, type that is supporting a need uh, in the community for uh, more affordable family oriented uh, housing of that of that type. So uh, supported uh, by city plan, uh, the OCP policies uh, for the area um, recommended to be secured with the rezoning our uh, road dedication uh, community amenity contribution of a thousand dollars per unit directed towards active transportation improvements uh, and that community amenity contribution is recognizing that um, uh, this uh, application came in prior to uh, council's uh, new community amenity contribution policy that came into effect of january of this year um, and as well, a commitment to BC Energy step code or a low carbon energy system um, commitment uh, in, a, in line with council's policy, as well as lot consolidation are all uh, recommended conditions of uh, rezoning. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Holm. I'm not seeing any questions. Councillor Thorpe, pardon me. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Sorry, I just got something in my eye there. It's not that emotional. No. Well, it, it was emotional because I, I drove to visit this site on the weekend. I had the pleasure of uh, making my way down Metro Drive. Metro Drive. I, 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 wanted, to, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, on my uh, agenda, it's the bottom of page 74 under City Plan Mobility Network. Uh, I just wanted a clarification and make sure I was reading this properly. So we're talking about increasing the density along Metro Drive at this particular site, uh, but we are asking for or uh, recommending a 0 0.3 meter road dedication to be provided to fulfill half of the difference required to achieve the full right of way width. So when it says in my report that Metro Drive is designated as an urban collector road, uh, and we're increasing density, but we actually have to get a road allowance because, because of the, the redesign of Metro, it's no longer wide enough to be considered an urban collector road. Am I correct? Um, through your worship, I'll try and uh, speak to that. I know it's a very minor um, additional road dedication. So through the- Very minor road dedication is right. I'm not disputing that. And I'm not disputing the recommendation overall of the development, but I'm very curious that we've, we've uh, modified an urban collector road in an area of increased density so that it now is, is too narrow to be considered an urban collector. And uh, I realize that's rhetorical, I'm sorry. Thank you. Did, would you like me to speak to that, or I'd love. Yeah, I'd love. I'd love you to. Sure. Thanks. So, uh, when we um, so the the road is designed to its ultimate standard, and uh, but it was designed when when we we're the city undertook the construction of the road and did have to do property acquisition as well. I'm not sure in the case of this property if acquisition was required, but we would have worked um, as as much as possible to to fit the um, the design into the existing road without. Um, necessitating property acquisition here we have an opportunity through uh, through rezoning uh, to get the ultimate uh, dedication which um, is 25 meters uh, 
for the, for the right of way in that area. Um, so we're just recommending that um, in in the event uh, looking long into the future um, that additional road um, uh, right of way is required there that we secure the full uh, 25 meters and take 0.3 meters from this property. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that explanation. And uh, your worship, I apologize if I was being cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> A little humor always moves the meeting along, <laughs> Councillor Thorpe. <laughs> Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. I just have a question on, and I imagine this will probably come at the DP site, but it's something if, if the developers here or whatever, is where they're going to access from and if it's going to be right turn only you know, with that number of vehicles coming into a, a very busy road right now. If I could. Sorry, if I could, through your worship. Um, yeah, the... Uh, details of the access design will be through development uh, permit at, at that point. Yeah, it's just something that that I want the, whoever's developing to be aware of. That will be questions I will have on traffic, and just wondering if a traffic study will be required as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perino. Uh, Your Worship, um, just a procedural question. So uh, we'll go through the readings, and get to third, and then go to a public hearing. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you. That. So then, my question is. Uh, through you, you again, as far as parking, it looks to me in the picture as though some of them have garages, some don't. I can't quite tell, and I just wondered, because I was concerned about the road as well, and, you know, would there be a, uh, adequate uh, drive-in area for homeowners, because, you know, you got one, two cars per household, so. Um. Through your worship, would you like me to speak to that? Please, you know? please, thank you. Yeah, so the, the details, what's presented is a concept plan, just identifying what um, conceptually could be developed uh, yes. under the, the zoning as proposed. Uh, the details will be addressed through a uh, development permit, but um, uh, at this point, we're not anticipating a uh, requested parking variance, uh, that the, the uh, required parking would be accommodated on site um, as well. I mean, obviously recognizing that it is on a on a very um, uh, much uh, improved, recently improved active transportation route and yes. uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, bus uh, service as well. So, but at this point, no requested parking variance is proposed. If any were considered, it would be through development uh, permit. May I just ask you uh, just one more question through you, Your Worship? It, it, so we go to public hearing on the conceptual design. Is that, is that right? Because I, I, I'm just having a little trouble so we're going to hear from the public and all they're seeing is a concept. Uh, yeah, if I could, through your worship, yeah, w staff would not be proposing to secure any uh, design at this point. It would be um, uh, what the zoning would support. Um, so it would support something similar to this okay. if the rezoning were approved by council. Ultimately, uh, a development permit would be required before, uh, before development of the site took place and the detailed site uh, design and, and uh, considerations um, with regard to bylaw compliance would be considered through that process. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. Councillor Hemmons, please. Thank you, I believe this is one I have to read. Uh, so I recommend that, uh, or pardon me, I move that zoning amendment bylaw 2022 number 4500.205 to rezone 5645 and 5655 5657 Metro Drive from single dwelling residential R1 and duplex residential R4 to low density residential R6 with site specific provisions to increase the maximum allowable floor area ratio to 0 0.75 and increase the maximum principal building height to 13.0 past first reading. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. I move that zoning amendment bylaw 2022 number 4500.205 pass second reading. Seconded, Councillor Armstrong. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Councillor Hemmons. And I move that Council direct staff to secure the conditions, <clears throat> excuse me, related to Zoning Amendment Bylaw 2022 number 4500.205 as outlined in the conditions of rezoning section of the staff report dated 22, 22 November 21 should Council support the bylaw at third reading. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. 
Next is Covenant Amendment Application Number CA18-514-540 Halliburton Street, 120 Needham Street, and 575 Nickel Street. Mr. Holm, again, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this proposal is for a Covenant Amendment application. And uh, what, um, maybe I'll just touch on um, uh, Council's uh, policy that is in place with regard to Covenant Amendments. Uh, so in this case, the re uh, covenant was secured through a rezoning in 1996 uh, that binds a number of the property titles. Uh, there was an additional covenant that was put in place uh, in 2005 related to a parking uh, requirement, uh, an off-site parking requirement for a, um, a liquor store that was proposed at that point. Um, but with regard to the uh, council policy regarding covenant amendment applications, so through rezoning, if a covenant is secured through rezoning, council's policy um, requires that either the covenant is considered, uh, covenant amendments considered through a public hearing, um, or that, um, that uh, a uh, notification similar to a develop development variance permit, so that would be a mail out and uh, hand delivery uh, notification, takes place prior to the covenant amendment um, proceeding. So either a public hearing uh, or a, a notification similar to development variance permit. So that's council's policy. Uh, given the nature of uh, the covenant amendment proposed here, um, staff is recommending that the uh, notification process can uh, proceed similar to a development variance permit. So notification by mail out and delivery. Um, what's proposed here is to uh, release the title binding um, covenant from the properties uh, in question, and as well as the uh, the covenant that secured parking offsite. Uh, and and then actually to uh, to secure to bind the titles to the two properties fronting on um, Nickel and uh, Needham Street the properties I should have mentioned overhead they front on uh, Nickel Needham and Halliburton so the two properties fronting on uh, Nickel and Needham if council were to approve this uh, would continue to have their titles bound with registration of a new covenant um, uh, the existing covenants would otherwise otherwise be removed from uh, the four properties uh, what, what this would allow is uh, development consistent with um, city plan with the OCP going forward. Uh, the designation for these properties, uh, residential corridor for the properties fronting on Nickel Street, and then neighborhood center for the properties fronting on Halliburton Street. So uh, in summary, the proposal uh, would allow for uh, the properties to be redeveloped uh, in a manner consistent with city plan, the OCP. And uh, I'm happy to take questions um, if you have any. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Holm. Councillor Armstrong? Yeah, I just have a question. So if, if we do this, and then for some reason it's already zoned for, for a pub, correct, and, and liquor, liquor store, can they come back in and do that now because we've got rid of, rid of those covenants and now they don't have to require the parking? Uh, part, sorry, I, I missed part of that, but I believe if I caught enough of it, Your Worship, uh, if they were to put a liquor store in place, they'd have to provide parking um, on site. You no, know, I realize that, but my point is right now, we've, they're, they're, their purpose behind the covenants was to ensure there was always the proper parking for the pub, et cetera, right? So if we remove that requirement and then they decide that they want to build another pub there, um, is there a mechanism that we can ensure there's still appropriate parking since there's no street parking any place in the area? Um, uh, yes, through your worship, actually, since that time, so that was 2005 that that uh, covenant was put in place and there is no operating um, liquor store there's no business that actually utilizes that parking now but uh, since uh, 2005 with the adoption I think it was in 2018 2017 of the current uh, parking bylaw for the city the parking bylaw actually allows um, off-street parking uh, or parking to be brought, provided um, off-site so on another parcel provided it's secured by covenant so Thank they you. could enter into another covenant arrangement uh, if they need to, to secure off-site parking. I mean, the odds are it's gonna be residential, but thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Hammond moves the recommended motion. Seconded, Councillor Armstrong. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None, motion carries, thank you very much. We're now on to bylaws, zoning amendment bylaw 2021 number 4500 decimal 196. Councillor Hemmins, please. 
Thank you. I move that Zoning Amendment Bylaw 2021 number 4500.196 to rezone 6033 and 6053 Nelson Road from single dwelling residential R1, duplex residential R4, low density residential R6, and Parks and Recreation and Culture 1, PRC 1, to low density, low density residential R6 and medium density residential R8, and Parks, Recreation and Culture 1, PRC 1, to allow a multifamily residential development be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. The next is Sewer Regulation and Charge Amendment Bylaw 2022, number 2496.36. Councillor Hemmings, please. Thank you. I move that Sewer Regulation and Charge Amendment Bylaw 2022, number 2496.36, a bylaw to include a provision that points to the Appeals Procedure Bylaw and other housekeeping amendments be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Perino. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. The next is Flood Prevention Amendment Bylaw 2022, number 5105.01. Councillor Hemmings. Thank you. I move that Flood Prevention Amendment Bylaw 2022, number 5105.01, a bylaw to include a provision that points to the Appeals Procedure Bylaw and other housekeeping amendments be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Perino. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. The next is Waterworks Rate and Regulation Amendment Bylaw 2022, number 7004.19. Councillor Hemmings. Thank you. I move that Waterworks Rate and Regulation Amendment Bylaw 2022, number 7004.19, a bylaw to include a provision that points to the Appeals Procedure Bylaw and other housekeeping amendments be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Item E, Management and Protection of Trees, Amendment Bylaw 2022, number 7126.02. Councillor Hemmings. Thank you. I move that Management and Protection of Trees Amendment Bylaw 2022, number 7126.02, a bylaw to include a provision that points to the Appeals Procedure Bylaw and other housekeeping amendments be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Perino. All those in favour? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. F. Property Maintenance and Standards Bylaw 2022, number 7242.02. Councillor Hemmings. Thank you. I move that Property Maintenance and Standards Bylaw 2022, number 7242.02, a bylaw to include a provision that points to the Appeals Procedure Bylaw and other housekeeping amendments be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Armstrong. All those in favour? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. The next is a Business License Amendment Bylaw 2022, number 7318.01. Thank or you. did I skip? No. Nope. Thank you. Right. I'm getting tired. <laughs> Carry on, Councillor Hammonds. <laughs> Thank you. I move that Business License Amendment Bylaw 2022, number 7318.01, a bylaw to include a provision that points to the Appeals Procedure Bylaw be adopted. Second, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. The next is Chauffeur's Regulation Amendment Bylaw 2022, number 7319. <coughs> Councillor Hemmings. Thank you. I move that Chauffeur's Regulation Amendment Bylaw 2022, number 7319, a bylaw to include a provision that points to the Appeals Procedure Bylaw be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Armstrong. All those in favour? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. And finally, I. Bylaw Notice Enforcement Bylaw 2022, number 7159, decimal 17. Councillor Hemmings. Thank you. I move that Bylaw Notice Enforcement Bylaw 2022, number 7159.17, a bylaw to correct references to bylaw provisions and address fine inconsistencies, be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. We have no notices of motion. We have no other business. Do we have something on question period? Thank you very much. Uh, Gabriella Reinhold on 12A, I believe she has left. And we have a Carrie Waters without indicating an agenda item. And I'm going to assume Miss Waters is left as well. We're just not that interesting anymore, are we? No questions? 
A motion for adjournment, please. Moved Councillor Perino, seconded Councillor Manley. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate your attendance tonight, staff and all.